So my name is uh, Nick Ferenczak. I'm an assistant professor in the civil engineering department at the University of New Mexico, and I'll be uh, moderating uh, track 1W here, which is covering automated and electric vehicles. Uh, I'm really excited for this session. We've got some great presenters here. Uh, we're going to start off with EVs and then get to CVs, and then we'll have two presentations on AVs. So uh, we'll first talk about quantifying the emissions, uh, impacts of repurposed EV battery packs in residential settings, uh, then getting to connected vehicles, signalized intersection control in a connected vehicle environment, user throughput maximization strategies, uh, and then getting to AVs, uh, we're looking at traffic operations uh, with AVs on our streets. Uh, and then I'll pre be presenting last, looking at human uh, perceptions uh, of AVs and how AVs will be communicating with human road users. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, sorry, uh, one second here. Okay, so our first presenter is Alizer Kawaja. Uh, Alizer is a rising fourth year undergraduate student at the University of Texas at Austin, studying civil engineering with a certificate in smart cities. He hopes to one day better communities by driving innovation at the intersection of emerging technologies, sustainable development, and urban systems. Uh, today, Alizer will be discussing his research titled Quantifying the Emissions Impact of Repurposed Electric Vehicle Battery Packs in Residential Settings. Thank you for that introduction, Nick. Let me just share my screen. And we've got uh, 20 minutes for presentation, and then we'll have 10 minutes for a Q&A after each presentation. Um, so please uh, put, put any questions that you have in the chat box, and then I'll be uh, providing those to, to Alizer at the end of his presentation. So take it away. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Awesome. OK. So thanks for joining us today. This paper that we'll discuss about today presents a methodology to assess and fill the research gap concerning the operating environmental impact of utilizing repurposed electric vehicle battery packs or behind the meter BTM battery storage system applications. Battery storage system is abbreviated as BSS. Um, the model developed as part of this research determines the current value of BTM BSSs, which is based on energy policies such as carbon pricing and battery costs, and along with their ability to minimize a household's electricity-related carbon footprint. So by doing so, this research serves as a framework to assess the feasibility of BTM BSSs for GHG greenhouse gas reduction purposes in many regions and countries with variable grid feedstocks. So this figure in the slide dep depicts both the share of plug-in electric vehicle, PEV, sales broken down into plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, PHEV, and battery electric vehicles, BEVs. We can see a notice noticeable difference in sales starting in 2018, attributed primarily to the lower cost test on model three, um, market share for EVs continues to increase year on year, and EVs now make up 2% of domestic new light duty vehicle sales, which is up from 0.7% in 2015. However, this still lags other countries like Norway, which has reached 50% new electric vehicle sales in 2019. Bloomberg NEF projects that by 2035, more than half of new US passenger vehicles could be electric, but projections are dependent on a host of factors, including government incentives, vehicle turnover rate, consumer demand for EVs, and when purchase price cost parity with, when, when purchase price cost, when purchase price cost parity with conventionally fused fueled vehicles is met. So as a result of increased EV sales, the global stockpile of used PV batteries is expected to exceed 3.4 million by 2025 compared to just 55,000 in 2018 capacities of used EV batteries is expected to grow at a rate of 186.5 gigawatts a year by 2025. And estimates on battery health show that used PEV batteries capacities may still hold 60 to 80%, which could under favorable conditions provide up to 10 years of secondary life as stationary BSS. So this process can provide economic savings of up to 60% compared to new storage systems. More recent battery technologies 
in Tesla vehicles may be able to reduce capacity loss to 10%. And one can expect to see smaller capacity loss over time as other OEMs learning curves accelerate. So while residential buildings and appliances are becoming more energy efficient, smaller residential carbon footprints or net zero can be achieved by transitioning to on-site renewable energy paired with battery storage systems. Repurposed BSSs are dynamic, flexible power sources for storing and dispatching energy. Applications of BSSs commonly used today include electricity load leveling, which includes discharging the battery electricity into the grid to curb peak demand, and energy arbitrage, which includes the storage of electricity when electricity prices are low, and utilize the same or sell the electricity when prices are high to benefit a homeowner. This paper takes an alternative approach and presents the methodology to assess the environmental impact of BTM behind the meter repurposed PEV BSSs through GHG emission optimization. More specifically, the objective of the BTM BSS in this study is set to minimize a household's carbon footprint by storing excess rooftop solar, if present, and low carbon stored energy from the grid to minimize power draw from the grid during periods of carbon intense power generation. To do this, we must consider the backgrounds and functions of BSS, which may significantly impact results. So for net positive emissions caused by BTM BSSs, they mostly can be attributed to round trip inefficiencies as shown in the image. Despite improvements in BSS technology, achieving a round trip efficiency rate consistently greater than 90% seems to be difficult with modern technology due to secondary losses caused by battery pack operation even when idle. For example, extreme ambient operating temperatures high and low can reduce PV battery efficiency by greater than 20%. In our study, homes in Austin, Texas, BT, in our study of homes in Austin, Texas, BTM BSS inefficiencies can increase annual energy consumption on average by 324 kilowatt hours to 591 kilowatt hours. For context, that's about two to 4% of average Texas homes annual electricity demand. Early studies also suggest that PEV owners may let go of their battery once out of warranty or after reaching eight to 10 years. However, advanced batteries capable of withstanding more charge cycles suggest that first life usage may follow the turnover of household vehicles of 10 and a half years or longer. The changes in battery design may even allow for resident residual capacities to remain unchanged or lessen to only 90%, even as batteries face more charge cycles. Assuming a DOD of 75% depth of discharge, after eight to 12 years of primary use, an eight kilowatt battery could hold around six kilowatts after repurposing. And that's the assumption we use in the study. While residential buildings and appliances are becoming more energy efficient, smaller residential carbon footprints or net zero can be achieved by transitioning to renewable energy paired with BSS. Since solar and wind energy sources emit zero GHG emissions at the source and continue to be supported by state policies through subsidies, these renewables are key to feasibly ensure lower emissions for BTM BSS users. Integrating renewable energy generation sources with battery BSS systems provide several energy management tools, which can be finally adjusted for homeowners, homeowners and power providers alike. Some of these tools include storing excess renewable energy, when, which can be injected back into the grid during evening peak, thus abating natural gas power plants. In this study, solar is the only source study for household renewable energy generation. And in the future, microgrids at planned neighborhoods could better distribute and manage distributed energy resources. So the figure shown in the slide uh, depict ERCOT's electricity feedstock for a one week period along with the corresponding energy factor calculations. One key variable contributing to the extent of possible GHG savings for home is a region's feedstock. Although emission factors vary by time of day, they follow a similar pattern with peaks at, early, at the early morning for Western US states. Identifying and utilizing this pattern is fundamental to optimizing GHG emissions, especially in regions where EFs vary significantly throughout the day. In this study, residences without rooftop solar are the primary uses, users of the previously mentioned optimization technique. 
While there is potential to minimize GHG emissions in this manner, several studies underscore how only adding BTM BSS is unlikely to reduce GHG emissions due to increased energy usage and unfavorable, unfavorable round trip efficiency rates. So now let's talk about some of the assumptions made as part of this study. Econ Street was generous enough to provide household electricity demand and rooftop solar generation data for 45 homes in Austin, Texas. We assumed a six kilowatt BSS, which was determined by assessing daily excess solar generation and selecting a size that could match solar generation capacities. We use literature to assume 10 year BSS lifespan and different cost estimations of repurposed PEV battery packs under low, medium, and high cost assumptions. Similarly, we assume different carbon prices based on existing and proposed policies in the United States. So while incorporated all to, into all simulations, the battery grade component of this functional model is a primary energy interaction for homes without solar panels to minimize GHG emissions through a peak shaving approach. This scenario functions by extracting and storing grid energy in the BSS when EF values reach a local minimum and consumption of the stored energy by the home occurs after when EF values reach a local maximum. And by EF, I mean emission factors. The solar battery grid component captures the production of solar and electricity and actively transfer this energy to the home for immediate use. Residences see direct GHG reduction by substituting grid electricity with 100% renewable electricity for periods of the, day, of the day when solar irradiance is high. Solar panels actively generate electricity for direct use and have an EF value of zero. And this zero is in terms of pounds per CO2 em emitted per kilowatt hour when stored. This interaction allows for solar energy to be stored when the panels produce more energy than the household demands. Additionally, the previously discussed battery grid interactions allow for greater GHG savings when solar energy generation is suboptimal and battery conditions are met. Since this study only accounts for GHG savings, emission, sa emission savings of excess solar generation are ignored in circumstances where energy stored in the battery is at capacity and can no longer be transferred to the battery. In the figure on the left, you can see pretty much the efficiency rates that we took into consideration as part of the study. So let's talk about a simplified version of our approach. The developed optimization model program used, uses EFs alongside demand curve data as a foundation to simulate BSS for daily continuous sample period. Each home has its own battery pack to store for future use, to store energy for future use depending on the household's power generation and electricity demand. To minimize a household's carbon footprint, the model uses a peak shaving approach and identifies periods of the day when EFs reach a daily minimum and stores energy from the grid for use during peak EFs later in the day. Since no electricity is carried over to the next day, we assume the battery fully or partially charges and completely discharges during a single day. So pretty much in this figure, you can see that the battery's charging at a consistent EF when it's, when it's low and discharges using that same EF during capture to offset, offset the grid, grid emissions later during the day. A general outline of the optimization process is depicted in below along with the corresponding equation assignments in parentheses, which are described further in the paper itself. So the steps are organized in the following manner. First, we prepare the raw data for analysis. Then we simulated the zero carbon energy source, which was solar, in, in, in collaboration with the BSS. And third, we optimized solar, battery, and grid functions for charge and discharge, along with calculation of CO2 savings. So let's talk about the results. The battery grid scenario optimized carbon emissions from six Austin homes and reduced on average 0.12 tons of CO2 per household in 2018. Illustrated in this figure is the household carbon savings range 
between an average minimum 12.3 pounds of CO2 in September to an average maximum 30.9 pounds of CO2 in July due to optimizing charging and discharging of the grid. Furthermore, the high variation of CO2 savings between summer and winter seasons is attributed to two points. One, the near doubling of average household energy use during the summer season compared to the winter season. And two, the electricity, the ERCOT grid dispatching inefficient power grids to meet the peak summer demand. The solar battery grid scenario optimized carbon emissions from 39 Austin homes and reduced on average 2.67 tons of CO2 per household in 2018. This figure shows how carbon emission savings calculated for solar battery component, solar battery grid component, vary significantly throughout the year, ranging from an average minimum 231 pounds of CO2 in February to an average maximum 727 pounds of CO2 in July. This variation of CO2 savings is, is especially prominent during the summertime as rooftop solar generation systems are prone to reach maximum solar production. So while results indicate BSS systems can reduce carbon emissions, the expected maximum quantity of additional power required due to efficiency losses is near 219 kilowatts annually, which would equate to an additional cost of $27.19 per Austin household. And this was calculated based on Energy Austin's progressive five-tier rate structure. Under the current carbon pricing model, an Austin homeowner with BSS would be compensated an average of 49 cents with rooftop solar, or $10.67 with roof, 49 cents without rooftop solar, or $10.67 with rooftop solar. Comparing electricity costs to carbon pricing benefits of the battery grids scenario, even the aggressive carbon pricing estimate is not enough to offset the cost of electricity. Meanwhile, the solar battery scenario ensures positive returns under all carbon pricing scenarios, as most energy is captured and used from rooftop solar. The break-even cost analysis results presented in the table below underscore how the rapid fall of battery prices and fruition of carbon pricing policies is approaching a tipping point where BTM BSSs will soon be desirable and may even add value to a home with rooftop solar. Assuming a discount rate of 3% on carbon pricing, BTM BSSs are profitable in three cases primarily under the minimum battery costs and maximum carbon pricing configurations. Under most other estimates, the break-even period is beyond the estimated lifespan of 10 years. We didn't include the cost of permitting or installing these systems. So that's something that should be considered in future work. And we'll talk a little bit more about future work on the next slide. EV sector growth, market competition, and product availability will continue to play a key role in reducing the costs of repurposed BSSs. We expect costs to continue to lower and market penetration to continue to increase in the future. So what are the conclusions? Homes with rooftop solar could reduce on average 2.67 tons or 2.42 metric tons of CO2 per household per year, while homes without rooftop solar could reduce 0.12 tons or 0.11 metric tons of CO2 per household per year, assuming an average household size of three people. For BTM BSSs to be cost effective for consumer use, the price of repurposed PEV batteries must fall to $15 per kilowatt or carbon pricing must increase to $38.75 per ton of CO2 for homeowners with rooftop solar to reach break even at the end of the estimated 10-year lifespan of the BSS. And these estimations are independent of one another. This study uses perfect knowledge of energy demand, solar generation, and grid emissions. Therefore, optimization performance is likely to decline as historical data does not always align with real-world observations. In addition, BSSs may also require maintenance and additional costs associated with the life cycle analysis, LCA, which are not considered as part of the study, but should be evaluated in this future. Lastly, the small data set of 45 homes provided by Econ Street is not a true random sample and does not represent all usage trends across the city of Austin. Future work should conduct cradle to grave life cycle analysis for BSSs and determine the impact of carbon pricing on a household decision to invest in BSS. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, if anybody has questions, please put them into the chat box and I will relay them to Eliezer. Um, but uh, in the meantime, as we're waiting for questions, I've got a few of my own. Um, I was wondering what are the possibilities for this uh, technology in maybe other parts of the country that maybe aren't um, as sunny and, and don't get the benefits of that, that solar energy? Um, have you thought about that? Or is that, that future work that you might look into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So just being able to correspond, being able to transfer electricity from one part of the country to another is, is pretty significant and has huge advantages, especially under conditions where um, situations where, where solar generation may not be optimal or under situations where there are emergencies and power and, and grids go out. So that's where this technology could be useful and also supplemental as well. I also had a question about the, you mentioned maintenance, uh, but also installation of these, these units. Um, I know I, I'm looking into building an electric motorcycle and a lot of people use uh, EV battery packs. So is this something like somebody could install on the weekend by themselves or are there companies that uh, can install these units or, or what does this process look like to actually implement one of these, uh, one of these units? Yeah, I mean, it all depends on size. So if it's, if it's relatively small, then you could install it yourself. But there, there are some technical challenges as far as installation goes. So it might be better to have an expert come in and do that for you. Um, traditionally, in, in homes that are buying these, these technologies right now, they, they do have larger systems which require installation from companies. So that's, that's, that's definitely the preferred route as of now, but there is, there is some opportunity to create more portable versions of this technology, whether it be some like vehicle-based or, or other, um, other forms. Okay. And we had a comment from Matt in the chat box it said, California has a rebate for install installing these battery units at home. I think $200 per kilowatt hour within tiers. And so any other, other questions from anyone in the audience? Well, I'll be monitoring the, the chat box. Um, so if you think of anything, please put it in there. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much, Alizar, for a great presentation. Um, and let's move on to our next presenter. Uh, so our next presenter is uh, Ruzva Mohammadi. Uh, he's a PhD student in transportation engineering at Aalto University in Finland. So let's turn it over to Ruzva. Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yours. Yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone from Finland. Uh, so let's share my screen. Uh, okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, today I present our paper, which is titled uh, Signalized Intersection Control in a Connected Vehicle Environment, User Throughput Maximization Strategy. Uh, so this paper is part of my PhD study under supervision of Dr. Claudio Rancoli and Milos Mladenovic at Alto University, Finland. Uh, let's uh, first uh, have a review on evolution of uh, urban traffic control. The first uh, traffic controllers uh, were developed in order to control railway and uh, road intersection. So this invention was also useful in order to relieve police from the intersection. After that, from 1920, uh, fixed time plans were developed when uh, a predefined green time is assigned to each approach of the intersection. And also green wave uh, was proposed in order to facilitate vehicle movement in a corridor. From 1980, by uh, emergence of new data collection tools, for example, uh, loop detectors, new traffic strategies uh, were developed, uh, such as actuated signal control and adaptive signal control, 
where the controller is able to adapt signal timing uh, to traffic demand. However, uh, if we review all of these uh, mentioned control strategies, we, we can see that all of these uh, controllers uh, have been developed in order to improve vehicle-related uh, performance measures, such as vehicle flow, maximizing vehicle throughput, minimizing vehicle delay, a stop, and also queue lanes. Emergence of connected vehicles has brought various opportunities to the field of uh, traffic control because connected vehicles can be a reliable source of real-time and accurate data. And by using this ability, we can reduce need for uh, infrastructure-based sensors. We can improve signal arterial coordinations. We can implement uh, various transit signal priority strategies. And also we can implement uh, signal vehicle couple control. However, beside uh, vehicle, vehicle data, we are also able to collect user data from connected vehicles. For example, number of passengers on board. Uh, in the literature, it's mentioned that implementing user-based strategy can be a good motivation for ride sharing. But however, uh, most of the literature focused on uh, vehicle-related performance measure. There are limited studies that consider users in uh, traffic control strategies, mostly for, uh, mainly for uh, transit signal priority and also in this uh, research. Uh, only average occupancy is considered for cars and also for buses. Uh, sorry. And here um, I introduced our user-based uh, signal timing strategy. Um, if I want to uh, explain it very simple, I would say that the main point of our uh, strategy is to consider users or passenger instead of vehicles in signal timing strategy. Uh, we developed this uh, signal timing strategy for a connected vehicle environment. Uh, exact number of users of each vehicle is collected, uh, 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 are collected besides the vehicle data. The main objective of the uh, signal timing is to maximize user throughput this can also give priority to high occupancy vehicles with higher number of passengers on board. For this purpose, uh, the first step is to predict arrival time of each connected vehicle to the stop bar of the intersection. So uh, in order to uh, do this prediction, we consider different case for different situation of the connected vehicles. For example, if the connected vehicle is in the queue or the connected vehicle is approaching their section, and uh, there is a separate case for the condition that the, the vehicle uh, arrives to the intersection before a startup green time, or if the connected vehicles arrive to the intersection during the green time. So for all of these uh, different condition, uh, uh, unique mathematical model is developed. Uh, you can find the uh, complete uh, uh, mathematical models in the paper. Uh, after uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, prediction of uh, arrival of vehicles, then we have our optimization problem. So the P is an indicator that uh, shows a connected vehicles can pass intersection in a current cycle or not. If yes, then it's one. If not, then it's zero. And the U shows the uh, uh, number of passengers or users on board on each vehicle. So if we sum all of these uh, uh, vehicles that are passing the intersection in the current cycle with their number of users on board, then we can estimate total user throughput for the intersection in one cycle. So by maximizing the, this function, we can maximize user throughput within a cycle of green time, within a cycle of intersection. We also consider some constraints such as uh, cycle time, minimum green time, and uh, maximum green time. If we consider that there is only one user on board of each connected vehicles, then this problem is changed to a vehicle space 
problem, vehicle space signal timing. Uh, in order to solve uh, this optimization problem, both uh, user-based and also vehicle-based, we uh, implement a genetic algorithm uh, to find the optimum splits of the uh, controller. In order to validate our methodology, we design a simulation experiment in a, a microscopic simulation software. So, uh, in this figure, you can uh, see our simulation framework. Uh, so actually, this simulation framework has two uh, main parts. Uh, so the first is the MATLAB, which we are uh, having our uh, optimization problem, and we solve it with GA. And on the other hand, we have the VSIM as a microscopic simulation software that we have our simulation environment. This VSIM and MATLAB are connected uh, via a GAM interface. And after setting uh, an initial setting, both for GA and also for the simulation environment, we start the simulation. At the beginning of each cycle, the data is sent to the MATLAB from Visim. In the MATLAB, GA finds the optimum during time by using mentioned uh, rival prediction, uh, uh, rival prediction um, uh, mathematical formulations, and also. The GA itself, after that, the optimum splits is sent to another module, which is cycle dynamic adaptation, because we use a fixed cycle in order to solve the optimization problem, then there could be some excess green time for each phase of the intersection. So in this module, we cut the excess green time in order to uh, keep the cycle uh, uh, shorter than a, a fixed cycle time, then the optimum uh, split is sent back to the VSIM, we run a new cycle, and at the beginning of the next cycle, then we repeat this process until end of the simulation, when we uh, collect the performance measure of the simulation environment. We consider three different types of uh, controller in this research, which are user-based signal timing, vehicle-based signal timing, and a fully actuated uh, signal timing as a baseline in order to compare our proposed methodology with that. So we consider a, a four-length signalized intersection with a NEMA ring uh, barrier controller. Uh, there is uh, two traffic demands, which are low demand and high traffic demand. For the number of passengers on board, so we consider five different user demand combination, as you see in this table. So the U1 is an indicator of vehicle types. It means that there is only one user, unconnected vehicles on U4, for example, means there is uh, there are four passengers on board on that connected vehicle. So for example, in user demand combination number one, by combination, uh, different shares of each of these connected vehicles, then the average users per vehicle is 1.7, while in the minor approach is 3.3. And in the user demand combination, we can see the, in the user demand combination number five, we can see the opposite condition, while in the number three, so the user demand combination is completely symmetric for all approach of the intersection. So here I show uh, a part of results of this research, but uh, I invite you to read our paper in order to find complete results and findings. So by combination of the vehicle traffic demand and user demand combination, so we have five different scenarios for each uh, traffic demand. For example, L1 means low traffic demand with user demand combination number one, and H5 means uh, high traffic demand with user demand uh, combination number five. Uh, so here we show the difference uh, of the user throughput and average user delay when we implement our user-based signal timing strategy to a fully actuated signal controller in order to see that how much uh, we could improve the situation by implementing our uh, proposed methodology. 
So in the user throughput, we can see that in total, we can increase the user throughput of, of the intersection by implementing this user-based signal timing strategy. So the difference is more clear in uh, high traffic demand when in total we can uh, increase the user throughput from uh, more than 300 users to uh, 565 in average. And also in the average user delay, we can also see the same situation uh, both in high traffic and low traffic demand. We can reduce average uh, user delay for the users of the cars in the intersection. We also measured the performance of each uh, vehicle classes, U1, U2, U3, and U4, and also all vehicles, under three uh, signal timing strategies, which are user-based, vehicles-based, and fluctuated signal controller. So in general, we can say that by implementing user-based signal timing, so the average uh, delay uh, is lower for U3 and U4 by implementing user-based signal timing strategy. But for example, for L3 and H3, when the user demand combination is completely symmetric, then the performance is similar in uh, user-based signal timing and vehicle signal timing as we expected. Also, again here, we can see that the differences in the, in the performance of the user base to two other uh, signal timing strategy is more clear in high traffic demands uh, where it's close to the saturated uh, traffic condition. We also measured the performance of the proposed methodology in a, a lower penetration rate. Uh, we didn't uh, implement any method in order to compensate the missed data, but however, uh, so the methodology itself can somehow adapt uh, uh, the condition. Uh, um, so as you can see, uh, for both user throughput and user delay, after 40% of uh, penetration rate of connected vehicles, so the user-based signal timing strategy can improve user-related performance measure. So the left figures are for user average user delay and right ones for the user throughput. Only in 20%, we can see that uh, the fully actuated signal controller uh, can outperform user uh, based signal timing strategy. So it's something that we can expect because in this condition, we completely miss the, the data of connected vehicles and also the users, uh, which is the main uh, component of our strategy. So in order to wrap up, I would say that our strategy can improve user-related measures in a signalized intersection. It's able to give priority to high occupancy vehicles with uh, higher number of passengers are on board, and also it has proper performance in a lower connected uh, vehicle penetration rate. For the future development, we are considering other uh, transportation modes, such as bus, pedestrians, and bicycles. And also, we are thinking to extend it to a coordinated user-based signal time. So this research has been published in IET Intelligent Transport System. I invite you to read our paper. And thank you very much for your attention. I would be very happy to hear your uh, question and also feedbacks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Um, Ruzba, is that correct pronunciation? Yes, completely Ruzba. true. <laughs> okay, great. Um, awesome. Yeah, very interesting um, topic. One that I've always wondered about. When are we going to get past just how many vehicles do we get through an intersection and think about how many people do we get through an intersection? Yeah. yeah um, you, you hinted at one of my questions here. And, and everybody in the audience, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start it off. Um, yeah, I was interested. Maybe you can see the bike in the background there. I'm a bicycle commuter. So um, how would you factor in um, other 
uh, human road users, bicyclists, pedestrians, so on and so forth, maybe people with physical handicaps that are going to need uh, mm -hmm. different accommodations at, at um, crossings, things like that. Yeah, that's a uh, very good question. Actually, actually, this is something we are thinking about that at the moment. So for buses, uh, we can have the data easily uh, compared to bicyclists and also pedestrian. But for them, we need another uh, data collection tools. So because this data cannot be collected like connected vehicles and buses. So we need um, some kind of another uh, external um, data collection tools, maybe cameras or maybe other type of detectors in the intersection. But so in the simulation environment, we can do it very easily. But in the real world, then there should be something there in order to collect this data. OK, yeah. And that led to one of my other questions was, uh, is the assumption that this road system is 100 percent connected vehicles? And mm -hmm. that's how you mm -hmm. understand how many users are in each vehicle? Yes, yeah, so the, the main, uh, the main uh, actually, the main algorithm is developed based on considering that we are in a fully connected environment. But we also tested the performance in lower penetration rate of connected vehicles without implementing any method in order to impute missed data. And we saw that, so from 40% uh, from, uh, uh, of penetration rate, so the situation can be better with implementing this um, user-based signal timing strategy. However, if there is any other method uh, for imputing this data or and somehow est um, estimation maybe can be implemented there, we can also have also better performance in lower penetration rate than 40%. And please, please enter your questions into the chat box, everybody. Um, I had a couple more. Uh, so it was it seems like a complex, um, a, a complex analysis that was was done and modeling. Uh, you talked mm -hmm. about MATLAB and then into to yeah. Um How would that be performed in the real world? Would there be um, you know, computers at, at mm -hmm. uh, every intersection that would be computing this, or would all this information get sent back to some um, master control room for every city, and then computations would be done and, and sent to the signals? Uh, how, how would this actually be implemented in the real world? Uh, so um, so the, the, the simulation part so, uh, is, uh, is something that happens in the real world, but the main point is uh, what happens in the MATLAB, for example. So the calculation time at the moment is something completely acceptable. I cannot recall the exact number, but we have it in the paper. How much is the calculation time for each uh, uh, for each iteration and for uh, each uh, cycle of the signal timing? And we did that with, with a very, uh, I would say, simple laptop uh, with a um, ordinary uh, uh, CPU. But if there is kind of uh, Mm, powerful computer there, then I would say that that would be something doable in a real time even. But the point you mentioned is completely true. For each intersection, we need the kind of uh, actually separate processor to do all of these calculations. Great. Um, yeah. Any other, other questions from anybody in the audience? All right, um, well, oh, and a link to the paper. Thank you, Matt. Um, so if thank there's you. no other questions, uh, thank you very much, Ruzba. That was really interesting. I'm, I'm waiting for the day that we can move beyond vehicle delay and get to user delay. Uh, so that's yes. really, really exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK, for our next presentation, um, we have Maria Basil. Um, Maria did her Bachelor of Engineering with high distinction in civil and environmental engineering uh, and a Master of Science in civil and environmental engineering with an emphasis on transportation at the Lebanese American University. She is currently a PhD student in transportation engineering at University of Texas at Austin. Um, she works as a graduate research assistant at the Center for Transportation Research 
Uh, she's the 2021 recipient of the WTS Heart of Texas Chapter Helen Overly Memorial Scholarship. And Maria requested that um, we use her recorded presentation. Uh, so Matt, should I pull that up on my screen here? I'm working on uh, showing it now. Okay. Um, for some reason, I may just have to do my whole screen right here and pull it up. So just give me one second. Okay. Uh, so move over here. Can you guys see the video now? Yep. Okay, let's play. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. My name is Maria Basile, and I will be presenting our research about the preliminary traffic operations analysis of autonomous vehicles. This is the detailed outline of my presentation. I will start by the research question. That is, what is the effect of autonomous vehicles on the traffic operations of freeways and intersections? Of course, this is a big question, but as the title mentions, this research only gives a preliminary insight on the potential effects of AVs. This research is significant because AVs, when implemented, are expected to improve capacity, safety, and traffic operations. In order to highlight the potential benefits of AVs, I would like to start by an introduction giving an overview of the transportation problems that we are facing and we will face in the future. The first major issue is the increase in demand. In fact, the U.S. Department of Transportation states that the U.S. population will increase by 70 million between 2015 and 2045. However, the development and constructions of roadways are not growing to match the higher demand, and just adding more lanes would not provide for a sustainable solution. Moreover, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration highlighted that 94% of motor crashes in the U.S. are caused mainly by human error. According also to the Federal Highway Administration, 25% of road congestion is caused by traffic crashes, and 50% is caused by demand exceeding the road capacity. Before starting our simulations, we did a literature review to see if there is any guidelines regarding the implementation of AVs and whether the lane width can be reduced and by how much. We found that a study conducted by Hayori and all mentioned that lane width can be reduced once all vehicles are automated. Our extended literature review shows that as the lane width decreases, there is an expected increase in crashes and reduction in free flow speed. However, according to the City Science Corporation, AVs have the potential to add capacity equivalent to 1.5 new lanes. Another literature review was done on the car following models to find out the best one that represents AVs. By definition, a car following model is one of many theoretical approaches and mathematical descriptions that studies the traffic flow on a roadway, assuming dependency between the motion of cars following each other under high density conditions. Over the past half century, tracks and roadways have been used to conduct research and field experiments on car following behaviors. The first car following model was proposed by Ruchel and Pipes. The car following model used in this study is Beeson's car following model that is based on a psychophysical model elaborated by Wiedemann in 1974. The model was revised and, and improved over the years, and the last improvement was in 1999. Moving on to the methodology, our methodology section consists of the simulation of the gradual introduction of fully autonomous vehicles into the traffic stream. Two setups will be analyzed. The first includes a freeway undisturbed flow segment and a freeway merge diverge segment, while the second is focused on an isolated signalized intersection. 
In all models, the gradual penetrations of AVs into the traffic stream is considered to better analyze the impact of this technology throughout all its adoption phases. Recent software will be used to model different traffic flow compositions ranging from 0% to 100% autonomous vehicles with 10% increment. The first analysis of undisturbed freeway flow considers a section of Interstate 5 freeway. Real-time traffic data and roadway information regarding road geometry were obtained from the freeway performance measurement system that collects real-time data from sensors. The second analysis is performed on a weaving section, including a freeway merge-diverge segment with a 1,000 feet distance between the end of the merge ramp and the beginning of the diverge ramp. Both ramps are on the same side of the highway and 10% of the through traffic and 10% of the entering traffic are expected to exit the freeway on the diverged ramp. Now, regarding the software used, the state-of-the-art microscopic traffic simulation software used in this research effort is the PTV vSIM. The improved technology enhancing the autonomy and connectivity of AVs includes several mechanisms that are first, change accelerating and decelerating behavior, change longitudinal behavior when following other vehicles, change lateral behavior and gap acceptance thresholds, and change decision making due to better provision of information. Now for the car following models, several car following models are developed for AVs depending on the car manufacturer and the assumptions made for the AV's expected behavior. For this study, PTV vSIM and Coexist project are the source of data for the AV parameters. Coexist, the European Union funded Horizon 2020 project, developed and defined the autonomous vehicles driving behavior and driving logic data that were incorporated into PTV vSIM simulation software and used in this simulation study. The Coexist major ongoing and comprehensive study aims to prepare the transition phase during which autonomous vehicles and conventional vehicles will coexist on urban roadways and highways. Now, dif now different driving logics for autonomous vehicles were defined by the Coexist project and consequently, a specific driving behavior parameter is attached to each category of these AVs as shown in the tables. The proposed parameters by the PTV group were defined based on empirical studies, co-simulation assumptions, and data collected from the coexist study. Please note that our simulations only takes into consideration AV all-knowing. Now, let's define some of the parameters defined by coexist. CC0 is the standstill distance which defines the desired distance between two consecutive vehicles at stopped conditions. CC1 is the desired time headway. Higher CC1 values characterize less aggressive drivers. CC2 indicates how much more safety distance the driver allows before moving closer to the car in front. CC3 defines how many seconds before reaching the safety distance the driver starts to decelerate. CC4 and CC5 control the speed oscillations after the vehicle enters the following mode of driving. Smaller values represent a more sensitive reaction of the driver to the acceleration or deceleration of the leading vehicle. CC4 is used for negative speed difference and CC5 is used for positive speed difference. CC6 represents dependency of speed oscillation on distance. And finally, CC7, CC8, and CC9 parameters control the acceleration. Continuing on the parameters of autonomous vehicles, also our simulation assumes that autonomous vehicles behave identically 
and have the same distribution of acceleration and deceleration. Unlike the diversity and unpredictability of human drivers' behavior and reactions, it was also assumed that the autonomous vehicles move in steady speeds. Therefore, the range of desired speeds for AVs will be much smaller than CVs. Since autonomous vehicles obey the speed limit as opposed to most human drivers that tend to exceed the speed limit and operate a wider range of speeds. The isolated signalized intersection simulated in this study represents a typical intersection found in most cities in the world. The geometry of this intersection is such that all directions consist of one through lane, one shared through right turn lane, and one left turn bucket lane. The first intersection simulation examined the base flow of 600 vehicles per hour per direction and contains 11 different scenarios for the intersection where each scenario represents a certain level of AVs penetration, from 0% to 100% AVs. Correspondingly, the second simulation examines the traffic condition at different levels of AVs penetration when the base flow doubles and reaches 1,200 vehicles per hour per direction. This gradual increase in AVs penetration was conducted as a sensitivity analysis for the effectiveness of this signalized intersection at different levels of AVs penetration. In all simulations, imperial units were used. Now moving to the results of our simulations, for the undisturbed freeway section, the figure in this slide demonstrates that the introduction of autonomous vehicles into the traffic stream did not improve the traffic conditions at low level of penetration. In fact, the penetration levels between 10% and 90% AVs can lead to unpredictable effects on the traffic flow. It is expected that mixed traffic of conventional and autonomous vehicles will behave worse than the 100% conventional vehicle traffic due to the unknown and questionable interaction between human-driven vehicles and fully connected and autonomous vehicles. Nevertheless, traffic streams consisting of 100% AVs are expected to experience significantly lower relative delays, higher speeds, and lower density. In fact, the relative delay in percentage, which is the ratio of average delay time to average travel time, is drastically reduced from 9.35% for the section operated by conventional vehicles to 1.51% for the section operated by autonomous vehicles to 0.5% for the autonomous vehicles section with the increased number of lanes. This is mainly due to shorter time headway between autonomous vehicles and their ability to anticipate the actions of preceding vehicles. This ability would also lead to smoother acceleration and deceleration, maintaining the riding comfort despite the short time gaps between autonomous vehicles. Now for the freeway merge diverge section, our results support the unpredictability of the mixed traffic flow performance. In fact, the introduction of AVs has worsened the traffic conditions by increasing the section relative delay and density and lowering the section speeds. During the transition phase, characterized by a mixed flow of conventional vehicles and autonomous vehicles, the average section speed, average section density, and average relative delay were oscillating, were oscillating unpredictably without following a specific trend. This means that the conventional vehicles and autonomous vehicles interaction is not expected to improve the traffic conditions, but in the contrary, it is expected to increase the traffic flow disturbances and friction and alter the AV platooning system. However, a traffic flow consisting of 100% AVs improved the merge diverge section traffic operations by reducing the average relative delay 
to approximately half the delay experienced with a flow of 100% conventional vehicles, from 15.92% to 8.05%. Now for the signalized intersection, under base flow condition of 600 vehicles per hour per direction, the figure in this slide shows that the intersection's performance improves as the percentage of autonomous vehicles penetration increases. This is translated by a decrease in vehicle delay and queue length when the traffic flow shifts gradually from 100% conventional vehicles to 100% autonomous vehicles. Vehicle delay drops approximately by half from 43 seconds for a conventional vehicle's fleet to 24 seconds for, a con for an autonomous vehicle's fleet. Similarly, the queue length is improved with the penetration of AVs and drops from 27 meters for a conventional vehicle's fleet to 13 meters for an autonomous vehicle's fleet. Now, the figures in this slide demonstrate that the variation trends of the vehicle delay and queue length when doubling the base flow aligns with the base flow condition trend. In both simulations, vehicle delay and queue length decreased gradually with the increase in percentage of AV penetration, reflecting the positive impact of AVs on the intersection traffic operations. Another interesting observation is the remarkable increase in the intersection capacity when operated by autonomous vehicles. In fact, for a flow of 1,200 conventional vehicles per hour per direction, the intersection has reached its capacity with a vehicle delay of 83.7 seconds and a level of service of F. However, for the same flow of 1,200 autonomous vehicles per hour per direction, the intersection has a vehicle delay of 29.8 seconds and a level of service of C. This difference in level of service demonstrates the potential improvements that the full deployment of autonomous vehicles is expected to bring to the traffic operations. Besides, the queue length is approximately decreased by a factor of four, which means lower risks of bottlenecks, lower driver's frustration, and thus lower chances of accidents and, re and red light violations and consequently higher pedestrian safety. In conclusion, the results of this study confirmed the positive impact of autonomous vehicles on the capacity, efficiency, and level of service of freeways and signalized intersections. They provide a promising solution to traffic congestions, traffic crashes, and travel delays that are worse at intersections. The limitations of this study is that the algorithm and scenario logics depend on assumptions of driving behavior and car flowing model logic in order to simplify the real world situation. Moreover, AB's related parameters are constantly questioned and revised with the continuous evolution of this technology. The recommendations are to create different roads and intersections configurations and vary the car following model parameters and assumptions since each autonomous vehicle manufacturer has its own confidential car following model code and assumption. Those are my references. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, and are you still in the room and able to answer questions? Yes. Great. Um, so if you have any questions for Maria, please put them in the chat box. Um, I can get it started again. Um, do you have any guesses as to why, um, what was it, the delay increased on that merge diverge section? up until about 50% AV penetration. Uh, no, actually that's what we are trying to analyze, why the, the delay was worsened. So 
our our analysis was, was maybe because of the interaction between the autonomous vehicles and the conventional vehicles. So maybe this this interaction is not well established, and the communication between the two types of cars that that might be the cause of the worsening the worsening in delay. Okay, I guess there's more interaction at a merge diverge uh, segment than an intersection or, or something like that. So, okay, that makes makes sense. Um, all right, Matt has a question. Why was it oscillating so much in the middle of AV penetration? How many random seeds did you run? Uh, the random seed is 42, and we run five stimulation for each, uh, for each condition. I have one other question. Um, so it, it looks like there will be operational benefits with AV penetration. Um, and you didn't study this, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, do you think VMT will increase um, with AV penetration? And if VMT does increase, how would that maybe dampen or how, how would that impact those operational benefits that you were seeing? Yes. So for low level of penetrations, of course, there is there is the that the VMT might be higher, and if the VMT is higher, the delay might increase and not de decrease. For the first phase, for the first phase of adoption, so we might not see the benefits of autonomous vehicles. I think we are still far from seeing those benefits of reduce, reduced delay and, and better safety. So maybe with, uh, with the first phase of introduction of autonomous vehicles, maybe the crashes would increase and the delays also would increase. So nothing is 100% sure. OK. Thank you. And then Matt also had another question here on page 15. How many lanes were existing to begin with? The right hand side had four lanes and six lanes. Did you consider yeah. cutting the number of lanes or were those scenarios cutting down lanes? Yeah. So I considered like reducing the lane width according to my literature review. So I reduced it a little bit to see the, the benefits of autonomous vehicles. So instead of four lanes, I, I did a scenario with six lanes. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions for Maria? If there's no other questions, thank you very much, Maria. Very interesting research. Um, and I guess we'll jump to our last presentation, which will be uh, myself. And can everybody see my full slides? Not full screen. OK. Presenter view. Sorry, I just got. OK, can you see it now? Yes. OK, just got hooked up back in the office, and my monitors are flipped for some reason. OK. Um, all right, so for anybody who entered the room before the beginning of the session, uh, my name is Nick Franchak. I'm an assistant professor in the civil engineering department at the University of New Mexico, and I'll be timing myself, but feel free to cut me off, Matt. Um, so what we're looking at is uh, pedestrians' perceptions of autonomous vehicle external human machine interfaces. So specifically, how will autonomous vehicles communicate with human users of the roadway? Um, for this, we're looking at pedestrians, uh, but we'll also talk a little bit, we're, we're doing testing right now, uh, looking at bicyclists and human drivers as well. Uh, so the objective, the overall objective of the work is to hopefully develop one simple uniform language for uh, autonomous vehicles to communicate with human users of the roadway. So uh, when we say simple and uniform, think about uh, turn signals or brake lights, things like that. Um, wherever you are in the world, um, whatever language you speak, uh, you know what, what that vehicle is doing when you see those lights. So we're trying to develop some kind of um, 
autonomous vehicle communication system. Uh, there's two big benefits of this, uh, perceptions and behaviors. So first with perceptions, where we look at things like, do human road users understand what the autonomous vehicle is gonna do? Do they trust the AV? Do, are they comfortable with the AV? But really what we're getting at at the end of the day is acceptance. Uh, so acceptance is relatively low right now. Uh, from surveys run in the US, it's about 50% of the public says, yes, I, I, I would uh, um, be accepting of AVs on the roadways. And about 50% say, no, I don't want AVs on the roadways. So um, it's been found that improving communication between these new technologies and human road users uh, can improve that level of acceptance. Also, we're looking at behaviors. So obviously, if you don't understand what an AV is doing, what its intentions are, uh, there's safety implications for that, like you can see on the bottom right. Um, so we need to be, be able to understand what this AV is doing so that we can interact with it on the roadway. Um, like Maria was just talking about, there's also important uh, traffic operations uh, implications of this work. So it may be if it takes an extra second of perception reaction time when you're interacting with an AV or you require an extra second of gap acceptance when interacting with an AV. Um, relatively small on the individual scale, but when you're uh, simulating entire uh, tr transportation systems, these little differences can have big implications in, in terms of traffic operations. So uh, we're looking at both the perceptions uh, of these different AV communication strategies, and then also how do human road users uh, alter their behavior based on this, these communication strategies. Uh, specifically for this work, we, we are measuring behaviors right now, but for this, um, we're looking at some preliminary data. Uh, we actually just had a paper published a week or two ago uh, on this uh, first round here. Uh, we're looking at specifically at perceptions. Um, so we're looking at understanding. Do you understand what the AV is going to do, what its intentions are? How quickly did you understand that AV? Um, also looking at comfort. So are you comfortable with AVs on the streets? Do you trust the AV? Uh, and then, like I said before, really what we're getting at is hopefully we can boost up that acceptance level of this new technology because it's still relatively low at this point. So our methodology, uh, what we did is we modeled our AVs in virtual reality instead of buying an autonomous vehicle and rigging it up with different interfaces and throwing it out on the street, uh, it would be expensive and dangerous. Uh, we modeled it in virtual reality. Uh, for this first batch of um, pedestrians, uh, looking at their perceptions, we got 47 participants. Uh, we're getting more participants as we speak, looking at behaviors, looking at bicyclists, looking at drivers. Uh, but for right now, we're looking at 47 participants uh, who went through the pedestrian simulator. So. Um, it was a within subject experimental design. So each uh, participant saw each of the different interfaces and we'll look at those interfaces in a minute. Uh, we had a 15 foot by eight foot VR area and we had a wireless headset. So you'd put on the headset and you could walk around freely around this entire area um, and you would interact with an autonomous vehicle that would have different interfaces. Uh, and then we asked you, what were your perceptions of that vehicle? So this is an example of what our VR scenario looked like. Uh, we used the HTC Vive headset. Uh, and for this experiment, we modeled it in Unreal Engine 4. So it's a little bit more realistic than uh, some of the other software that's available. Uh, what we did is we uh, performed a task-based uh, trial so that indicator shows up in the middle of the street and the participant is told you need to go hit that indicator, but there's this autonomous vehicle coming that you need to negotiate with first. So like you can see, we have a number of different interfaces on the autonomous vehicle. In an actual trial, there would only be one interface at a time. Um, and we flipped it up. Uh, so sometimes the AV would yield for the pedestrian and sometimes the AV would not yield for the pedestrian. So the participant always had to negotiate with that AV because they didn't know what was, what was going to happen. 
Uh, the interfaces that we use were actually designed based on interfaces that are being proposed by AV developers right now. Uh, so in the top left corner, you can see those two pictures. There's a big text-based interface on the grill of the vehicle. Um, that's being proposed by Smart. Um, and also, I think that is the Uber um, patent application right there. Uh, on the top right, we have a little bit smaller text interface. Uh, that's either on the windshield or on the top of the vehicle. Uh, that's being proposed by Drive AI and Nissan. Uh, bottom right is a uh, simpler uh, interface um, being proposed by Ford and Volvo. So it's just a simple LED strip. Um, the LED strip is solid when the vehicle is just driving. Uh, and then once it detects somebody and it's yielding for that person, then the LEDs blink uh, and move back and forth. And then the bottom left is, I believe that's Waymo's uh, patent. And they have, in addition to a number of other things, they also have those uh, arrows on the side mirrors. So we based our interfaces off of these uh, proposed interfaces. I always like to show this one, this is kind of fun. Uh, this is Jaguar Land Rover's idea for their external human machine interface. Um, some googly eyes. So once it detects somebody, the uh, AV will actually look at that person to indicate, I see you, you can cross. Uh, they don't say what's gonna happen once there's one person on both side of the, sides of the street. Uh, does the vehicle go cross-eyed? Um, we didn't model this one, but I just think that's a, a fun one to mention. All kinds of different ideas being thrown out right now. Uh, not a lot of research looking at what is the most effective. Uh, so our interfaces, uh, we modeled this uh, text interface on the grill, and you can see the bottom, that's what ours look like. Please proceed to cross and the arrows blink. Uh, the text interface on the roof, uh, ours is on the bottom. It says proceed to cross and the text blinks when it is yielding for the pedestrian. Uh, the LED windshield, so like I said before, the LEDs are solid when the vehicle is driving. Once it detects somebody, the LEDs blink and move in and out. And then the side mirror arrows. Uh, so once the AV detects somebody, the arrows show up and they blink to let them know they can proceed to cross. So those are the four different interfaces that we used for this research. Uh, I will note that, like I said, we're continuing this project. Uh, we're bringing in bicyclists. We're bringing in uh, human drivers as well. And we're finding that uh, especially for drivers, as people are kind of positioned further back in the intersection and they're waiting for this on autonomous vehicle, trying to figure out, does this see me or not? Uh, they have a better view of the side of the vehicle. So uh, we also added in this fifth display, uh, which is our side door display. It says, please proceed to cross. And you can see how it's much more visible uh, than the interfaces on the front of the vehicle. This one is not in our results for pedestrians, uh, but this is something that we're, we're looking at currently with drivers and bicyclists. Uh, so each participant saw each of those different interfaces. Uh, we also flipped it up, uh, whether the AV stops for the pedestrian or does not stop for the pedestrian. After each of those trials, uh, we administered this survey here. So, uh, we're looking at, and it's on a five-point Likert scale, and we're looking at, did you understand the AV's intentions? How quickly did you understand the AV's intentions? Um, were you comfortable with the AV? Did you trust the AV? Uh, and for acceptance, we asked, how excited are you to have this AV on your street? Um, these were pretty direct questions. So to look at comfort, we just asked, were you comfortable? Uh, we're also administering uh, some tests right now where we have full-blown validated surveys for each of these factors. Um, that being said, validated surveys have like 20 questions each, and we're looking at five different factors here. Uh, so it's, it's pretty lengthy, and there's some um, uh, survey fatigue involved. So we're trying to find the right balance of asking direct questions because there's a lot of trials to go through, uh, but also having strong questions that we can get some good results from. Okay, so on to results. Before looking at which interface was best, we looked at does an interface improve perceptions or not? And the answer is yes, the interface improves perception. So um, 
higher answers are improved perceptions, higher trust, higher comfort, uh, higher acceptance. And we saw that there were higher responses with the introduction of an interface versus uh, AVs that did not have any interface at all. So uh, interface definitely seems to improve people's perceptions of this new technology. Uh, the largest increase was for question three, which was uh, interface versus speed. So we asked people, did you base your decision off of the interface or did you base your decision off of the speed of the vehicle? Uh, so of course, as we introduce an interface, uh, people are going to use that interface uh, to, to base their decision off of. Um, smallest response was for question seven, which was acceptance. And this is something that we've seen throughout our research. Um, understanding improves with interfaces, comfort and trust improve with interfaces. Um, but acceptance doesn't have the same response as these other uh, factors. So, and, and we've, we've seen this throughout, um, you, you'll see this throughout this presentation, and we continue to see it as we bring in bicyclists and drivers, uh, this acceptance of this technology has, has a smaller response than these other factors. Uh, females reported higher scores overall than males, but males uh, had a larger response to the introduction of the interface. So uh, you can see here, uh, without an interface, females had much higher responses than males overall. Uh, but once the interface was introduced over here, the male responses are much, much closer to the female responses. So females overall uh, had higher perceptions, better perceptions of AVs but males had a larger response once that interface was introduced. Looking specifically at which interface uh, had the, the best perceptions, uh, the text interface on the grill had the best perceptions followed by the text interface on the roof, then the side mirror, mirror arrows, and then the LED windshield. Uh, this was pretty consistent for all of the questions except for question seven. So uh, you can see here text on the grill, uh, 4.66, that was the highest response for all the interfaces, 4.24, highest response, so on and so forth. So that text on the grill uh, was, was the best response. Interestingly, for acceptance, uh, that flips a little bit. So you can see the LED windshield 3.76 actually had the highest response for acceptance. Um, An LED windshield scored the lowest for all of the other factors, but it scored the highest for acceptance. So again, that acceptance factor is, um, shows different patterns than all of the other understanding convert trust questions that we asked. Um, this is kind of just talking about the statistical significance of our results. Basically, the text grill had the highest responses. And also, those differences were statistically significant. Um, the other differences weren't as strong uh, for the other interfaces. But text grill was uh, by far uh, the best, best um, perceptions out of all the interfaces. So overall, it does look like the presence of an interface does improve perceptions of this new technology. Uh, females, again, had better perceptions of, of the AVs, but males had a larger response to the interface. Uh, the text grill interface had the, the best responses, uh, except for acceptance. Again, acceptance kind of followed a different pattern from all of the other questions that we asked. A uh, few other conclusions. This is not part of the pedestrian research that we were talking about. This is kind of moving forward, what we're seeing right now. Um, but we talked about this before, drivers and bicyclists to some extent as well, since they're back from the intersection a little bit further, um, they are preferring the side interfaces a little bit more than the front interfaces. So most of the existing literature out there is looking at these front interfaces. And that's why we, we based our initial research off those front interfaces. Uh, but we think the side interface is going to be an important part of the, the answer as we move forward. Um, one thing that we're looking at right now is we're bringing participants back longitudinally and we're um, repeating uh, the trials and we're looking at is there a learning effect um, as the participants become acclimated to this new technology. And we're finding that yes, uh, after even as few as two or three trials, 
uh, participants are kind of getting the hang of, oh, this is what I'm looking for on this vehicle. Um, so although the participants really liked that text uh, grill interface, uh, we're finding that as we bring the participants back, um, they're tending to prefer simpler interfaces as they get used to the technology. Uh, so this is an important uh, next step for us is to see, continue to test these participants and see as they get used to this new technology, do they prefer different interfaces uh, than the ones that they initially preferred. Uh, some predictions, uh, we predict that interactions with AVs will actually be quicker than with human drivers. Uh, I think that when you pull up to an intersection, uh, you're trying to make eye contact with the driver. Uh, and this is just when uh, the right of way is ambiguous. Uh, so you're trying to make eye contact with the driver, or maybe you're waving them or flashing your lights, something like that, I'm trying to figure out what is this person doing. Uh, with these interfaces, we actually think those interactions might be a little bit faster than they traditionally were. Um, we also predict AV communication will be easier to understand at night than current uh, communication. Uh, that's just because we have these uh, lights on the vehicles. It's going to be much easier uh, to, to understand what the AV is doing, uh, to understand uh, the AV uh, quicker. So some future questions that we want to continue to look at. Um, although participants preferred that big text-based interface, um, how do we overcome some of those issues with text? Uh, so there's legibility issues, uh, perception time, right? You need to actually read the text and then perceive what does that mean? Uh, might take an extra second or two. Uh, language barriers. So uh, there's a number of different issues that we need to work through with, with that text, uh, those text interfaces. What role does the size of the interface play in perception outcomes? So that text interface on the grill, had the best perceptions, it was also the largest interface. So we wanna look at um, what role, is it just because it was a really large interface, it's easy to see, uh, is that why people were giving it the highest rankings? Uh, so we wanna look at the role of size as we move forward. Uh, the learning curve, we just talked about that. Uh, do people's preferences change as they get acclimated to this new technology? Uh, what role might color, sequence, time of day, weather conditions play? So we would expect different results as we change up these different variables. Um, are text displays still preferred when there are 10 AVs at an intersection? So we looked at interacting with one single AV on the street. Uh, what about when you're at an intersection and there's 10 different AVs all around you? Um, maybe you would prefer a much, much simpler uh, interface to understand what these AVs are doing. Uh, so that's another next step for us. Uh, and then do participants' subjective reports and intentions represent their actual behavior? So um, somebody can say something in uh, a survey in a lab setting, but does that actually correlate with their actions out on the roadway? Uh, we want to uh, continue to do this research and, and see if there is a, a connection between uh, those. So thank you all for your attention and take any questions that we might have. Sorry, I revealed my video, but thank you, Nick. You're the moderator, you're also a speaker, so you can't really thank yourself. Um, but yeah, I hear you guys have finished this session in record time. So we have a lot of questions in the chat box there uh, in case you've unrevealed that. Okay, yeah. Um, why do the AVs look so unhappy? Where's the smile? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the. Uh, uh, googly eye uh, interface proposed by Jaguar and Land Rover, but yeah, there's a lot of interesting uh, interfaces uh, being proposed by AV developers out there. Um, uh, why are all the interfaces directions on uh, on from the AV? Did you look into smartphone apps, wearables that can buzz or send a message to pedestrian bicyclists about an incoming AV? Um, we have thought about that. I, we're, we're typically leaning against that kind of option because uh, it kind of puts the onus on the pedestrian or the bicyclist, which is the more vulnerable road user here. Uh, so what if we have um, a lower income community or maybe I just forget my phone or my device or whatever I'm carrying or my device runs out of batteries, um, right? Then that vulnerable road user is uh, put at risk. So we don't want to put the onus on the pedestrian or bicyclist. You need to carry this device to keep you safe. 
uh, we, we're, we're trying to um, put the onus on the, the vehicle it's, itself. Um, that being said, certainly uh, smartphone apps that could supplement these interfaces um, would be, be something to, to look at. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked at that quite yet. Uh, have you considered incorporating wearables that can collect uh, physiological indicators? I know Ped Bike Lab at UVA is doing this work. How does survey data compare to physiological data? Yeah, very good question. Um, I thing that pops into my head is uh, at least for bicyclists, uh, bicycle level of traffic stress. There's been a, a bit of research looking at uh, reported uh, stress levels and comfort levels for bicyclists. Uh, and then some people have actually strapped up devices to measure heart rate and breathing and, and things like that. Um, there has been found to be a, a correlation. Um, how strong that correlation would be for our responses to the actual physiological responses. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, would, I would hope that the survey instruments were strong enough that we would uh, get a strong correlation there, but certainly um, something we'd, we'd like to look at in the, in the future. Um, I should have mentioned we are measuring behaviors. Uh, we didn't report on that quite yet. We don't have enough information or, or data yet. Uh, but we're doing things like measuring uh, vehicle speeds as people are in the VR simulator. We're measuring turning, uh, sharp braking. Uh, we're measuring eye movements, uh, things like that. So we should have some behavior data to kind of back up these subjective uh, responses soon, uh, but not enough data currently to, to say anything definitive. Uh, how about visually impaired pedestrian crossing? Yeah, very good question. Um, that would be uh, adding uh, audible cues to this would certainly be another next step here. Um, that being said, imagine being at a busy intersection with 10 other vehicles around and all of them are trying to send different beeps to communicate. Uh, that gets really, really complicated really quickly. So um, yeah, something we, we definitely uh, need to, to think about, uh, but fortunately don't have an answer quite yet. Uh, but very good question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you can skip my long question there. Go to okay. Matt's at the bottom because it's more relevant. Okay. Uh, in the virtual environment, are there other stimulants that can distract users that are trying to understand the prompts? Yeah, very good question, Matt. Um, so yeah, we're running into uh, VR sickness uh, is, is a real issue. I'm gonna say maybe we've had, I don't know, maybe a quarter or so of our participants that go into the VR environment. It, it wasn't as big of an issue in the preliminary uh, data collection that we did with pedestrians, uh, but especially with bicyclists and driving, uh, the driving simulator, once you put on that VR headset and you're sitting in the car seat, uh, you can really quickly get VR sickness. Uh, it just kind of feels like seasickness. You're expecting these physical forces on your body and it's just not happening because you're just sitting in a chair. Um, but uh, it's, it, it definitely is an issue. We run a VR sickness questionnaire and we monitor it closely. And if anybody's feeling any kind of sickness at all, uh, we have them take the headset off and we throw out the, that data because it would be biased. Um, so yeah, it, it is an issue, uh, something we, we keep track of, and unfortunately, we don't really have a solution to it yet other than just throwing those, uh, those data out. Um, have you made any considerations in or outside your work to pair infrastructure-based solutions in addition to vehicle prompts? Um, so no, we haven't thought about infrastructure-based solutions quite yet. Uh, with all these other great presentations we've seen in the session, uh, looking at traffic operations of AVs and CVs. Um, yeah, that's something that we, we definitely should be thinking about, um, but we haven't um, tested anything infrastructure-based quite yet. Oh, and I, sorry, I, Mahmoud, I, I missed your question. Uh, why not proposing a new light similar to headlight or brake light for AV so that peds and cyclists understand the intention of the AV. Um, yeah, I, 
based as we collect longitudinal data and we uh, get these repeated measures from the participants, we are seeing that they trend uh, towards preferring the simpler interfaces as they get acclimated uh, to them. So I, I would imagine that um, although people upon first interaction with an AV really like that text, I imagine that over time they would prefer something like a headlight or a brake light that's just extremely simple. Um, very little perception reaction time involved uh, everybody knows what it is wherever you are in the world whatever language you speak um, so yeah I, I think we are trending towards that um, and I, I think we'll want to come up with some other um, possible interfaces like I said we use Google and Way, uh, Waymo and Uber and uh, Ford and all of their proposed interfaces right now, but I think we might want to propose our own that might even be simpler than, than those. It's a very good question. Thank you. Yep, young children can't read the text. Um, yeah, lots of, of issues with text, even though it seems to be the preferred uh, option right now. Yep. And Matt asked about other stimulants that can distract users that are trying to understand the prompts. I don't know that you've tackled that question yet. That was the virtual reality sickness uh, oh. answer. So <laughs> as more stimulants come across and directional flow, um, people can get um, that sickness and have to leave. Yeah. yeah, I remember getting sick in Sydney where they had me drive out of a parking lot and get on the road. And supposedly you're supposed to start slowly, but I guess I didn't start slow enough or something. And so I was out. I, I took myself out. I wasn't a, a surveyed member, but I, I was just test driving. It was hard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're finding that uh, we kind of had a practice course uh, for the driving, the bicycling, where people would actually turn around and the turning really does it. So uh, right now we just kind of have people drive down the block to a stop sign, interact with the AV. We kind of got rid of the, that turning that really seems to impact, impact people. Yeah, the whole parking lot entrance. Yep. So any other questions for Nick? I, I, I'm, I know we had a couple of people enter late and so we are ahead of schedule here. So you guys can you know, take a break until uh, the hour and, and join uh, the next sessions then. Um, but I'm gonna keep Nick in this room because I wanna see if he can answer some of my tech questions. I'm not an equipment person. Um, but are there any other questions on, on this particular topic you guys wanna throw out or research you wanna mention? Okay, well, Nick, I, um, you know, was sorry that when we elected Donald Trump, NHTSA did not impose a connected vehicle uh, mandate for all new vehicles and then all new trucks, because uh, I do think that basic safety message would be really useful and really cheap. And I know manufacturers are always waiting for the next thing like 5G rather than DSRC. Um, but it would have been pretty easy to retrofit, I think, just to add something for maybe $60 a pop onto people's vehicles in, and we can still do that. Um, but I hear from the manufacturers that they won't trust any other, you know, signals um, message. So they won't react if uh, something says, I'm going to hit you from the right side, or I'm coming uh, in this direction. So, you know, I'm not sure how much that information will get used, but I, I do think it would be a helpful thing. And what do you think? Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I'm a big safety guy. So whenever we talk about autonomous vehicles, we, we always talk about safety. Um, and one thing I always mention is, I forget off the top of my head, um, but there's the reference to the NHTSA statistic that 94% of uh, collisions are caused by human error or at least somewhat attributed to human error. Uh, so we can eliminate that, really improve safety. Uh, but there's also some other NHTSA statistic, um, I forget it off the top of my head, but um, just using all of the available technology that we have today, um, like assisted braking and, and all of these other technologies that are available and could, should be standard on our vehicles, we could eliminate like 50% of the collision. So not 94%, but just, what we have today could could really get us close uh, and save a lot of lives. So yeah, I mean, I would completely agree that there's a lot of progress that we really could be making. Um, was it perfect is the enemy of the good? So yeah, I, I completely agree that 
um, using what we have. We, we still want to be moving towards um, uh, AVs that are going to be much more efficient and improve safety much more, but uh, using what we have today um, at our fingertips, I, I definitely completely agree with. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you think though, if we were to um, require connectivity with DSRC, it would be less than $100 per vehicle right now to send that basic safety message and to hear that basic safety message and it could talk to your phone, you know, so you just get this little app that says, okay, here's what I'm hearing. <laughs> and if I don't like to hear all that chatter, you know, if it's too much or whatever, I can, I can remove certain messages or all messages, but it's a way like there might be deer um, that have been reported and might be a roadside device with video getting that. So it doesn't have to be, I'm always listening to other vehicles coming at me or pedestrians who happen to have that same device, maybe kids whose parents have invested 60 bucks in a little device to put on their backpack um, with a battery. In my car, I'm lucky I have a source of power pretty much, um, but the, the kids with backpacks, they, they don't. So they got to take a little battery and replace those. Um, but do, would you be a proponent of adding that now? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. It, again, kind of like uh, my answer to Matt's questions, I, I don't think we should re completely rely on it, but I mean, something like that could certainly supplement the, the safety measures that we have today. So yeah, yeah I, I would be a proponent of that. And I'm, I'm actually not up on that um, research, so I'll have to look more into it. But um, based on what you're describing, yeah, it definitely uh, seems like it could, could improve people's awareness of what's going on and um, hopefully improve their, um, uh, I guess, engagement with the, the roadway around them. Um, so yeah, that, I think that would be, be a great idea. Okay. And then I wanted to ask you, because you seem to be much more of a, a gadgets guy than I am. Um, so things like speed enforcement and uh, congestion pricing, real-time congestion pricing, even lane by lane, um, you know, what would that take? That may not be something you have much to say on right now, but you may, you know, in a year or something, I'd be able to do a study with your students pretty quickly. Uh, so we, we'd love to hear how to make that um, cost effective because right now those big gantries with road, you know, with these um, cheap little tags on your vehicle, you know, 25 cent tag, but the gantry is so ugly and the, the video and everything that kind of um, really large enforcement is, is, is expensive and, and ugly. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, every time they pass through a gantry here in Texas, they pay 25 cents off the top to the administration of the system, which is such a waste. Um, so they end up paying much higher tolls than anybody would ever pay for gas um, tax um, to use the same road um, if it weren't tolled. Uh, so yeah, it just seems like a, a big opportunity to really uh, specify the technology for our DOT and to get that out. And I know Oregon and California do little pilots for dongles and stuff like that. Um, but we can even do odometer reads right now, even with just our cell phones, you know, report that with our yearly registration and get a VMT fee in place really easily if people are, are upset with our tiny gas tax uh, and they want more equity for all of us EV drivers, you know, because we're not paying the gas tax. Uh -huh. and we're just saving your grandchildren's. <laughs> <laughs> lives and property. Um, anyhow, do you have any thoughts on that kind of technology? Have you looked into that at all? Um, I'm, I'm really excited about um, kind of what you're talking about with automated enforcement. Um, I, I try to keep up with it. I know, um, you know, red light automated enforcement uh, comes and then it's really unpopular and then they get rid of it. And uh, same thing with uh, automated speed enforcement. Um, also, right now, we're not safety, but um, we're developing a device uh, that automate, uh, automates um, vehicle noise enforcement as well. Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, like the cops do not go after those guys. It's like all the cops are motorcycle riders or something. They're all friends with these people. Like, what is this? Well, yeah. these laws are on the books, and we are totally not enforcing them. Yeah. 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 So, I guess the, in my mind, it's not an issue. In my mind, we have the technology, we can do it, um, but they need 100% you know, proof uh, legally that this noise was definitely coming from this vehicle. And that uh, requires, if you're looking at an intersection, you actually need a you know, calibrated uh, 
up to a certain standard sound level meter at each leg of the intersection. And then you kind of need to triangulate to make sure that that noise was coming from that vehicle. Um, so it's, in my mind, yes, the, the noise was coming from that vehicle. We can tell that, um, but they need it 100% water uh, or airtight. Um, so we're actually working with the legal team in our county right now to figure out, is this enforceable? Um, um, and, and same thing with uh, speed enforcement. Speed is such a huge factor in safety. Um, the question is, right, you detected my vehicle going over the speed limit, but was I the driver? Uh, my phone was in the vehicle, but, you know, I could just say I was in the passenger seat or, you know, my friend borrowed my phone in my car. It wasn't actually me that was speeding. Um, so there's all, all these little, little issues uh, that we need to work through. But I, I think this automated enforcement, I mean, other, lots of jurisdictions do automated speed enforcement, automated red light running enforcement. Um, so I, I definitely think it's possible. I think we need to work at these kinks and, and get that kind of automated enforcement, uh, whether, it's, whether it's through a device or a dongle or however we're detecting it, I, I definitely think that should be a huge part of, of our transportation future. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we look forward to your contributions, but yeah, let me know if you need any particular applications. I do a lot of crash work. I do a lot of pricing work, um, your vehicle ownership work, all these things. So yeah, we're lucky to have you in the field. Nick, how long have you been teaching there? Uh, I've been at University of New Mexico for three years now. Okay. I was born not too far away. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Neighbors over in Texas, New Mexico. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, thank you for, for having me here. It's, it was a great session. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers, you guys. Nick did a great job moderating this. Uh, Matt, we are so appreciative. Matt's holding down the fort for five hours today as our tech staff. He did this last year too. He'll be doing it tomorrow again. Um, and I'm going to just stay in the room, but you guys are all welcome to head out. But I'm, I'm happy to chat um, with people around the world. Um, as I've told people, this is the Olympics of transportation today. We've got people all over the world. You're all getting up to the podium. You're paying zero dollars for this entertainment and uh, athleticism that we're seeing of these terrific scholars. So thanks for being part of it. Yeah, I'd love to hear if anybody has any input on that automated enforcement of red lights, speeding, noise, whatever. Uh, if anyone has any input from how you do it around the world, I'd love to hear that. Singapore is probably a good one, but Australia, you know, is much more similar to the US and they actually require, I think, an ID tag, an RFID tag on the bottom of the vehicle, which is really nice. So they don't need something up high um, and every vehicle has to have it, which is fantastic. So um, as people run over, they, they, they get speed um, enforced around Sydney and probably Melbourne. And they're not too different from the US. So why can't we do it here, people? <laughs> Atima, Shadi, it's good to see you in here, Mike. Good to see you too. <laughs> it was a great discussion. I enjoyed it. Ben, are you going to be our moderator in the next session? I somehow think uh, you may be a moderator. Maybe he has stepped away. Yes, he is at UCL. Uh, ben is our. <laughs> and Mike Highland. Michael, where are you now? I forget where you are. Still in Irvine, California. Okay, Still and then um, do you do you have that PhD or like? Oh yeah. Okay, um, so oh yeah, you moved from Northwestern. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm. Well, you're so young. You know, you could be a student, but no, he's a professor. No words at all. Thanks for putting this together, you and everyone else. Um, of course. Did you hear your advisor speak this morning as our keynote? Um, no, I'm hoping it was recorded. Oh yeah, it's all recorded. Okay. So. 
That's another thing that distinguishes us from the sporting Olympics. We record and you can watch it at your leisure at any point after we get it on, on, at YouTube next week. Um, I wish the Olympics would do that. I would love to have at my leisure watch some of those events. So I just paid five dollars last night to watch the basketball team play. <laughs> yeah, I would pay 20 to just have a week of, you know, viewing privilege <laughs> and be able to jump, jump around. What did uh, Hani talk about? Well, it's kind of a new talk, but you know, it ties in uh, to everything. So it's really how we've relied so much on information and communications technologies during COVID. It was a massive experiment. Mm -hmm. Our economies held together. It was pretty amazing to me personally, um, as many people shifted to a totally different lifestyle for shopping and work and childcare education. Um, so he was talking about the importance of modeling both supply and demand and the dynamics. So not just modeling demand, but you know the supply is really an important equilibrium. Um, and you know shocks and stochasticity or randomness in the system of these connected supply chains. Um, anybody else want to chip in on what you took away as a highlight from Hani's keynote? I'll just say that that sounds like his uh, broad research agenda applied to COVID. So <laughs> I think you nailed it. And yeah, he talked about his mimic model um, with an ordered probit uh, uh, maybe extension. I don't know if you're familiar with that model. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's collaboration work with several other faculty there at Northwestern. But yeah, I think they were controlling for, you know, age and gender and occupation and stuff for a lot of um, people's adaptations uh, to, you know, COVID restrictions. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Charisma, you have a lot of papers with your students at this uh, uh, BTR. Sarah, it's nice to see you. Sarah is a recent yes, graduate. Um, uh, we grabbed the opportunity, like, you know, like uh, the, uh, there were not many conferences this year anyway. So that was a good push to get the students uh, have their paper written and all these things. And um, it's, uh, I think the, the last year from, uh, I think the audience has also increased compared to last year as well, right? Yeah, and we opened up an Eastern track, so they're going to still have to build. Their audiences are much smaller, but I was listening last night because it was eight o'clock my time, nine o'clock my time, 10 o'clock my time. And um, so I was walking my dog. I was exercising while I was watching their, their sessions. And um, they had people from Tokyo. They had a Pakistani in Tokyo. They had Iranians also presenting um, and yeah, it was, and of course, Australians and, and Chinese and their keynoter was in Hong Kong. So it was, it was really nice, but we will, we will need people's help to build that side of the program um, in coming years because they're, they're at about one third our, our size. So um, we'd love to see them have more participants in coming years. Well, I, I really li like this conference, like, especially I think um, because it's online, uh, like, there are participants from countries who really struggle to attend conferences in person. So it's great. Really. Thanks a yeah. lot for your, all your hard work. That and carbon. So the visa issue, especially for all my Iranian friends, mm -hmm. that and, and the climate crisis, you know, or the climate emergency or catastrophe, whatever you want to label it, those two things are what gave well, You know, the other thing is also the funds. Like I, I taught in Bangladesh for a couple of years and there it's so difficult to get to a like, um, conference uh, that's of quite course. far away. Yeah, and the effort, you know, my husband is always mad at me when I come back from a conference. It's like, I don't need that grief. And the effort, you know, just making the plane reservations and the hotel reservations, I don't need that time stock on my busy life. So this is just wonderful. Um, yeah. So this started before COVID, guys. Uh, we had no idea COVID was coming, but this was all in place, fortunately, uh, before we had to deal with those, those lockdowns. I was telling my students, actually, the attendance in the, some of the sessions may be better than the attendance in the TRB sessions, because in TRB, it was quite mixed. Like in some sessions, it, it was quite a small audience. 
Yeah, we should probably add posters in the future too for those um, you know who think they might be asleep. I feel sorry for people. Uh, gosh, like in India, <laughs> um, and even in Europe, you're in Europe. And so it's starting to get quite late there, um, Russia, Ukraine. Um, so, you know, this, we may have to open all these other tracks or go all around the world um, with a, a rolling presentation to try to make sure everybody can be wide awake for their presentation. But it makes it hard to create the program when you're constrained, not just on topic, but on timing. Uh, but yeah, very, very important. We've got lots of students presenting. There's no cost to their advisors for this, which is wonderful. Thanks a lot. There's Ben. Ben, uh, you take it away. Thank you so much for being uh, our, our next moderator and take your time. Of course, we're ahead of schedule, so. Well, thank you for uh, arranging this, Cara. Um, I particularly enjoy the Eastern and Western concept. Um, the, having attended conferences where the timetable has been a compromise, which in some ways work, works not so well for anyone. Uh, uh, th this, is, this is good. It's a comfortable timing for me, and I hope for you too. Good, good. Is it six o'clock now in uh, London? Uh, it's coming on for seven o'clock summertime. So um, I, I used an automated system to check, check on the time difference so there wouldn't be an hour out. Yeah, we need to add more of those uh, lines to the program. You know, the program is so complex, um, but we really should add those. Check your times here uh, lines mm -hmm. to that, that program as well. Yeah. And how much darkness do you get each night? Is sundown like... 10 o'clock or 9.30 and uh, sun up um, at five? It, it, it's, at, at this time, it's about five until um, uh, nine daylight, 5 a.m. till 9 p.m. daylight. So uh, we get a one hour shift for the daylight scene. Uh, in Scotland, uh, they, get some, they get another hour each end. So it's a big difference. Uh, how much daylight do you get in, in Texas? Oh, we're pretty low latitude, so it's it's pretty natural. I think the sun technically goes down at 8.30, and I don't know what time it comes up, maybe 7.30. <laughs> you yeah. didn't look. <laughs> I put on a I put on a bandana and, and avoid the whole sun up experience. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that our um, uh, presenters today have uh, all been very good in uh, providing, um, providing short bios. And uh, everyone was right on time with their uh, um, uploads. So here we are, brief bios. Um, Mark Edward. Hi, Mark. Mark Edward, shall we call you? Yes, hi, I'm here. Okay. Uh, are you all ready to start, Mark? I'm ready, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're, I think we're on time now. No, we're a minute early. We just give it a, a minute for the uh, uh, people to join. Um, so, Mark, uh, uh, ready for about 20 minutes presentation? Sure. Um, and uh, maybe I'll raise a hand at 15 minutes. Okay. So indicate, indicating about five minutes. I won't, uh, I won't hold you to that exactly. Okay, so um, you're sharing your screen, I see. Um, colleagues, welcome to, to this session uh, on uh, uh, this session of the BCR3 conference. Our first speaker in this session uh, on analytic methods is Mark Edward Schultheis, a doctoral student um, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and also a visiting researcher at Mobility for Futures Collaborative at uh, MIT. He's interested in activity travel behaviors and he investigates the effect of habits and routines 
on resistance to change in the context of individuals' mobility practices. So, uh, Mark Edward, uh, please tell us about your work on spatial familiarity. Yeah, um, hello everybody. <clears throat> uh, so first, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present this research here. Um, so I'm Mark, I'm a PhD student at EPFL in Switzerland. Um, I'm doing quantitative sociology. Um, and I will present today um, some very recent work on spatial familiarity and mobility motives. And this is part actually of a larger project um, on multi-day and multi-person activity scheduling model that we conduct together with Jeanne Di Pugala and Maria Kukic, who are um, affiliated to a transportation modeling and optimization laboratory and who are in the room as well with us. Um, so the subject of territorial uh, sustainability is central to our faculty and the discussions often come to the conclusion that the sustainable uh, turn is not only digital and technological, it is also sociological in a sense that people's motivations, intentions and attitudes um, are strength that modelers um, and planners should value very much. Um, yet it is not trivial to approach uh, these concepts. Um, so this is why we joined forces um, uh, between modeling and sociology to try to improve traditional modeling approaches. Um, I wanted to, to switch slide. I wanted to introduce um, this presentation by uh, displaying some of our previous work about um, activity diary patterns. So we used an agglomerative clustering algorithm to segregate the population, the Swiss population, into 10 groups of travelers um, based on travel diary parameters, uh, like uh, the time of first departure and the time of last arrival, the number of home loops, uh, the maximum distance from home, extra. Um, and so here you can see on, on the slide uh, three, three groups traveling in the city of Geneva, Switzerland. So these groups do not travel at the same time in a sense that, uh, for instance, commuters mainly travel during peak hours. They do not travel at the same place. For instance, afternooners trips are more spread across the whole territory. Um, and they also have different trip lengths. So for instance, complex travelers uh, usually perform small trips, but lots of small trips. Um, we also leveraged um, open data. And so by cross-referencing those clusters with the public transport uh, schedules, we came up with an indicator um, assessing the gaps between the demand and the supply um, in the public transit system. So you can see here um, uh, the bus stops. So the dots are the bus stops. And so when a dot is green, you have an excess of public transport supply um, at this specific stop for uh, this uh, given time slot. So here it's the evening peak hour. Um, and when a stop is red, you have an excess of transport demand. Um, so this helped us demonstrating that depending on your daily activity diary, um, you may not have the same needs and you may not have the same opportunities in terms of accessibility. Um, and, and the model, uh, the model shares and, and time allocation also vary with respect to, to those activity patterns. So observing um, travelers from the perspective of their daily activity patterns was the first step to finer representation of travel demand. Um, and if we step back at the theoretical foundations, uh, research on travel behavior is scattered. Um, and it seems like uh, it, lacks, it lacks of unity. And I'm not personally sure uh, where to posit myself. Um, and often urban sociologists and transportation modelers or academics and, and practitioners do not speak the same language, yet we, we, we want and we, we pursue the same objective. So, um, there exist also several behavioral frameworks um, that try to combine the different facets of um, activity travel behaviors, and that are the premise of our of um, activity-based approaches in general. Um, this shows actually that lots of efforts have been put into grasping the variety of determinants influencing mobility choices. Um, in addition to this variety of determinants um, of 
methods. Um, the nature of available data is also very heterogeneous in terms of um, uh, collection method or even information they hold. Um, and so such a variety poses the question of um, how to account for finer mobility determinants to help the transport system being more sustainable and to accompany travelers in their ecological transition. So in response to that, we propose to work along uh, three directions. Um, first, to go back to the fundamentals of movement, uh, space and time dimensions, um, by studying the action space and the activity scheduling. Second, um, it is to update our methods um, and knowledge with what GPS data can offer. Uh, we are used to work with ad hoc surveys and, and expensive census that happens every five years, but most of the generated data today um, might be raw basic geolocation logs. So it's important to know how to use them. Third, explore the longitudinal dimension of movement over several days. Um, so the repetitive choices leading to routines and habits. Um, in the method part, um, so the thing about habitual practices, um, as the literature says, um, is to bring stability to behaviors. Um, people do not adapt the way they commute every day, uh, rather they find a satisfying route and mode and stick to it. Um, so in other words, uh, developing habits makes daily life easier and habits strongly influence the motivations to change and to adapt mobility practices. And this can slow down uh, sustainable transitions. Habits are very important in this work and form uh, one of the main hypotheses, uh, which says that habits hold latent information about daily choices in the act in activity travel diary. The second hypothesis uh, concerns the influence of the relevant others on a traveler's daily decision making. Um, so the methodological framework is made of three parts. Uh, the first one, the part one, uh, is studying the action space and the trip schedule, then establish a set of metrics um, to operationalize spatial patterns and temporal patterns on a daily basis. Uh, the part two, um, investigate uh, the chaining of these spatial temporal patterns, uh, develop a daily activity scheduling model, as well as a household generative model. And the third part consolidates all the parts together um, um, to yield a multi-day and multi-person activity scheduling model, uh, which accounts for both habits and uh, what we call coupling constraints uh, between the different members of the household. And so today <clears throat> we will uh, exclusively focus on um, the metrics defining the action space and the activity travel structure, which is made of two objects, mobility motives and spatial topology or spatial familiarity. The first object I wanted to, to discuss is the mobility motive um, as illustrated here. Um, so in a nutshell, we wanted to have an easily implementable and understandable object referring to somehow um, temporal habits or the temporal structure of a, a travel diary. Um, the idea is to abstract the daily activity structure as a directed graph um, in which vertices represent um, the legs between visited places and, and nodes represent location activity tuples. Uh, so to obtain these graphs, uh, we did some geographic clustering, we isolated home, and we did some um, additional cleaning in the data. And as is pretty common in graph theories, we work uh, along the complexity of the graph, of the motif. Um, we came up with an entropy-based complexity, according to the literature. Um, and this, this index not only considers uh, the time distribution of events, but also the number of transitions between events, so uh, visiting a place. Um, to better understand a complexity that tends to one implies a high number of trips and higher irregularity uh, in out of home schedules. And actually complexity is particularly important for model choice and car users. Um, if you allow me this uh, small detour on another research um, on model 
choice in Switzerland, uh, people were asked uh, for during a survey to describe their uh, perception of car with some adjectives. And we notice that convenience and independence remain major arguments for car use. <clears throat> so with a car, people can be as complex as they want in their activity scheduling. And to me, this is probably one of the major reasons of resistances to change <clears throat> um, in model habits. The second object <clears throat> I wanted to discuss uh, is activity space. So why the motifs um, integrate the schedules and activity chaining? The idea here is to focus only on the spatial properties of movements. Um, this is the second dimension of habits, um, the spatial habits. So by taking observations over um, several days, we were able to compute topological metrics. Um, for instance, the most visited points um, some centers, uh, mean distances, uh, shapes, where people are very likely to, to be um, at any time T. Um, here, um, you can simply visualize some processed habitual spaces of different travelers. Um, so even though the shapes of uh, motifs that I introduced before are not so varied, as we will see, uh, the distribution of these motifs in space is very singular um, and may be a good candidate to run um, a classification and to obtain a typology of habitual spaces. In order to get there, um, so to the classification and to the typology, we first need to operationalize habitual spaces um, with a, a set of metrics. The idea is to capture metrics that refer to a form of spatial familiarity, what we call spatial familiarity. So the, the, the literature on, on that is not very furnished. So our proposition to capture uh, this familiarity goes along these lines. Um, each point is labeled with a frequency of visits. Uh, these are simply based on the count of visits over a given period of um, time and then categorized. Uh, we define also regularity as a fraction of number of frequently visited places over, the, over all the visited places. So a small regularity implies high locational innovation. We also define a habitual action space. So you can see the hull and a global action space. You can see the ellipse. So the proximity um, is a relative um, dispersion of habitual action space. So if the proximity is greater than one, you have a spread habitual space and a close to home innovation space. And lastly, um, home shifts uh, is the distance between home and the weighted mean center uh, of, all the of all the visited places. And so home shift provides a measure of uh, residential isolation from the activity space. So data. So um, we use uh, a great data set in this project, the MOBI study, which tracked 3,700 participants over eight weeks in 2019. And this is one of the few data sets that allows um, longitudinal study of um, activity travel behaviors. Um, and so, Mobis uses mixed data collection uh, methods. So participants have to fill in uh, a questionnaire, uh, mainly for sociodemographics at first, uh, before entering a uh, uh, tracking phase. Also, um, data pre-processing is a significant part of this project. It is not trivial to transform raw GPS data uh, to mobility data, yet I think uh, it is important to make this uh, process uh, easier and seamless for um, practitioners. Um, again, because most uh, of the produced data today uh, are GPS data. Um, and so, uh, now the results. Um, so we found 360 plus motifs um, among the almost 200,000 uh, uh, collected diaries in Mobis data. 
Uh, but if we look at the cumulative density of motifs, um, keeping only the nine most occurring motifs allows us to capture 86% of all the motifs, which is very convenient for studying habitual practices. And as you can see, the nine typical motifs are actually very simple ones. Uh, so the first motif is a single home-based activity uh, kind of uh, diary, which holds almost 40% of all observations, um, which is high but consistent with the literature. Uh, motif two is a two-activity home-based loop, and motif three is a stay-at-home only type of uh, diary with 11%. We notice that motive seven holds a higher complexity with 0.61. It is only um, the only one with a non-home-based um, loop, um, which makes sense given our definition of uh, the complexity index. Um, I will pass on this one. Uh, it was just to show the distribution of complexity, which, which is quite varied. And, and, and we are currently working more on, on, on this complexity um, index to see who is complex and who is not complex. And I will show you some uh, results afterwards. Um, here, uh, this figure shows uh, the density estimation of several parameters, like uh, the daily trip distance, or the maximum distance from home, or the time of first departure. Um, each color uh, matches one motif. And interestingly, most of the distribution are insensitive um, to the motif to which they belong, as they have uh, very similar shapes. However, um, these three distributions caught our attention. Um, the time of last arrival seems to hold a two-class distribution for the complexity index and the time spent at home. Uh, there are noticeable irregularities between the motives. And, and once again, uh, this confirms in in the intuition that the motives and uh, their complexity may be an interesting approach to build a motive-specific activity scheduling model. And also these KDE plots um, highlight that home uh, seems to play a particular role in activity travel behaviors, um, which is worth exploring when it comes to scheduling. And lastly, um, this table crosses the complexity index and spatial familiarity metrics with sociodemographics and accessibility uh, measures. Um, so the gender subtable is probably the most intriguing. Uh, women and men have opposite behaviors, in particular, even though females hold um, a lower uh, mean complexity, the variation of complexity is higher. This implies irregular schedules um, and a need for um, high temporal adaptability. From a spatial perspective, uh, though, women tend to more irregularity with a spread innovation space and a neighboring habitual space. And we can do this, um, this exercise for uh, the size of the household, for instance. We can see here that a three-head family, mostly two parents, one kid, is less stable in terms of out-of-home schedules and travel more than two or four-person households. And especially um, three-head households live close to their home and seek for less variety in uh, activity location. When the family gets bigger, people tend to recover a taste for travels and tighter schedule. Um, and looking at uh, model practices now, uh, regular car drivers have higher regularity in schedules, but have dispersed habitual space and a higher propensity to visit new places. So general accessibility also shows accessibility specific spatial temporal behaviors um, in a sense that a high accessibility implies spatial regularity, close habitual space and small variation um, in schedule. Um, so the conclusion, um, just to review quickly what I just said uh, and then open the discussion. Um, so travel habits are considered twofold um, with a spatial and a scheduling dimension. Uh, spatial familiarity is defined as a joint interpretation of uh, proximity, regularity and home shift. 
complexity index allows to account for the senses of convenience and independence in car use, which is critical to me. Um, the relation and connections to the dwelling is important uh, in the characterization of travel habits um, and the shape of habitual activity diaries. Mobility motives help to focus on habitual behaviors and typical diaries um, and integrate schedule and activity chaining. Um, the level of abstraction of mobility motives allow further digging as well in privacy-based behavioral research, which must also be part uh, of uh, sustainable territories. And um, investigating activity scheduling patterns allows to better address uh, the needs of travelers, as well as the reasons um, of the resistances to adapt their behavior in ecological term. Um, so our very next step is to define a day-based uh, typology of travelers, integrating their complexity and spatial familiarity, um, and to study the day-to-day -day chaining of these uh, different profiles. And by the end of the year, we will wrap up the class-specific activity scheduling model that integrates um, notions of both uh, spatial and temporal habits. Um, so Janody uh, has the lead on this. And lastly, build a gen generative model to artificially create a multi-person data set out of individual traces. And Maria has uh, the lead on that. Um, thank you very much for uh, your attention. And um, we are available for, um, for the discussion and any questions. Thank you. Mark Edward, uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, intriguing presentation. Um, <clears throat> and it, it seems that you've used uh, a large resource of high quality geotemporal data to um, establish current behavior and in particular relationship to uh, of, uh, travel patterns, travel habits um, to observable variables, covariates. Um, now in I'm working from the chat for, for uh, questions. And the first question is actually a point of clarification. Could you help us, please? Um, uh, we've been asked, considering the sequence of trips, uh, how can motif happen? Could you return to the motifs, please, and uh, trace out the sequence of uh, sections in number nine? So, yeah, um, so the famous you, Koningsberg Bridge problem, I fear. The coding what problem? The, the Koningsberg Bridge problem. Um, yeah, so so um, basically you can have, uh, if, if uh, a traveler goes back to the same uh, location to perform the same activity several times, uh, you can have uh, this kind of motive. So for instance, let's say you have home here, um, you go to work, go back home, you go back work, and then you go to a bar, and then you go, you go home. So each edge in that graph could be traversed more than once. Exactly, yeah. Okay, right. Thank you. That's uh, uh, very helpful. Um, so I, uh, I would like to ask a question about policy sensitivity. I think what you've shown us um, is an analysis of data describing what people currently do and the relationship between their own um, personal characteristics and family circumstances um, and their uh, travel patterns. But do you have any idea of policy sensitivity? If we change things such as the cost of travel, which I think were increased by public transport, uh, or we change parking to make car less convenient. Do you have an idea of how these mobility motifs might change? Um, so one of my um, basic uh, hypotheses for my own PhD uh, project was that um, this kind of constraint doesn't work anymore. Um, it has been like the case for the past decades to like financially or economically constraint uh, people for their mobility behaviors, but I think uh, this will come to an end. 
And um, uh, if we want to reduce car use uh, in cities, uh, we have to find other solutions. And, and these solutions might um, be somewhere in um, better understanding how households uh, work and how people organize themselves um, on an everyday basis uh, to really integrate these kind of uh, elements in, in, in policies. Um, I don't think the, the activity patterns or the motives will change. Um, I just want to um, try to understand um, why the, the mode of transport not, do not change for, for these models. And, and this is a resistance to change, what I call the resistance to change in mobility practices. Yes, good. Um, I, I believe that one of the effects of um, the famous COVID pandemic uh, is that travel will become more expensive and hence more valuable to individuals. So they are uh, planning to make less, uh, fewer trips, and make better use of each trip. But that is, that is pure surmise. I have no evidence for it. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, Mark. Uh, just, just to mention um, another part of this research um, about give, give us an adjective describing um, car use. We also asked the question, give us an adjective describing uh, public transport. And, and one of the most uh, cited adjective was, um, um, public transport is expensive. And, and in reality, I think it is not, um, at least in Switzerland, because we have uh, a general um, uh, fee that you can pay yearly and which costs uh, less than $3,000 uh, a year. And then you can use any public transport um, uh, in the country. And I don't think that a car costs um, less than this. So, um, uh, I think we, we still have some work to do on, on perceptions uh, of uh, the different modes um, and, and still um, activating this, uh, this uh, constraining, uh, financial constraint uh, is, is, um, has limits, I think. Can I ask a question about this slide? Please, please proceed. Yeah, so you mentioned you collected data on car use and public transit use and the um, perception of the attributes of that. I'm wondering about ride hailing, ride sourcing, taxis, right? Um, presumably they're somewhere in the middle in terms of supporting the convenience and complexity that travelers want to be able to have throughout the day. Um, to, trying to start some work on my own in this area, but I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts. Either did you get data from people on this? And if not, uh, what do you think about kind of what they would perceive as the value of those modes? Uh, so we only had uh, four modes, I think. Um, uh, the two additional modes were uh, cycling and walking. For cycling, the most um, uh, cited adjective was dangerous, uh, which is a pity because um, uh, Switzerland is putting a lot of her uh, in the cy cycling infrastructure. Um, but still, uh, this, is, uh, this is still the case. And, and for walking, I, I don't remember the details. Um, and so what was the question about taxis? Sorry? Well, I, like, so does Uber and Lyft exist um, in the study area at the study time? Um, no. No, OK. Um, well, then I guess the question is about taxis. Do you think that they share some of users share the perceptions of taxis as they do with individual car use or are those completely separate modes that will not, that is, will taxis never really be a main use for um, complex travel chains? Um, I, well, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, people, yeah, people probably see only the car. Um, so it might be the same uh, perception, um, even though it's a service and, and it's more flexible and it's, yeah, I don't, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing, if you're like shopping, right, you can't store stuff in the back, back of a taxi cab. But for the most yeah. part, it's, there's no schedule, there's no route, you have complete flexibility in terms of getting to and from places, but you can't really store stuff at places. 
Okay. Um, colleagues, I think in, or, in order to uh, maintain the schedule, we will, the conference schedule that is, we will need to uh, pause the discussion at this point. Uh, but Mark Edward, uh, I'm sure, will be willing to pursue uh, the various themes, including uh, questions posed in the chat. We've not, we've not had time to uh, to hear about just now. So, Mark Edward, many thanks for that. Wish you every success in your doctoral studies, and uh, look forward to uh, learning of your thesis, your publications in the future. Many thanks. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, our next speaker is uh, Katun Zanat, I understand uh, addressed as uh, Zanat. Um, Zanat is from Bangladesh, she's uh, a doctoral student at the Institute for Transport Studies ITS at the University of Leeds. He's in his second year, so well progressed in his research. Um, his the title of his uh, uh, research is Improving Public Transport Planning and Design Using Novel Data Sources, and if that sounds fam familiar, that must be a theme of this session. Um, his particular research interest is on transport planning, uh, using big data to help in understanding travel behaviour of individuals. So, uh, Zanat, uh, please, please uh, tell us about your work. Okay, thank you. Um, hello. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I am Khatun Zanat, as Benjamin said. Um, I'm a second year PhD student. So the title of my today's presentation is Modeling the Time of Travel Preference capturing the correlation between departure times and activity duration. So this is the organization of my presentation. At first, I will talk about why we are interested about this research and what is the goals and objectives of our research, which will be followed by data and modeling framework. Then I will end up with the result findings and the concluding remarks. So uh, traffic congestion is a perennial issue for both in developed and developing countries economic expansion, rapid urbanization, or mixed effect of different policies and program are seen as primary trends that have exacerbated this traffic condition in urban areas. So um, shifting departure time into the off-peak time period using traffic uh, condition pricing or road tax could play an important role in reducing downtown traffic condition during the peak time. Also, it has been considered as um, as an effective and easily executable and demand management strategy. Therefore, it's important for us to understand different factors affecting departure time choice of decision makers and how uh, this uh, departure time uh, is uh, dependent on or is being affected by different sociodemographic groups. So for, um, this is the main interest of my research here. And, um, to model the departure time choice uh, following the discrete choice model, um, uh, we can model, we can do this uh, using two approaches. So one is uh, to use uh, the loss of utility using the schedule delay time. That means that utility is captured uh, by the time of preference and um, uh, with the schedule delay time. And the second approach is uh, the using the constants associated with different time periods. Uh, using the schedule delay term, it's useful when doing the exploratory modeling, but it's problematic for forecasting. So for the purpose of forecasting, researchers have used constants associated with uh, different time periods. And uh, therefore, the number of constants uh, are used in the departure time choice model plays a significant role in, uh, in the model interpretation, in the computation and transferability of the model. Therefore, um, uh, different researchers have used the small number of course time period or large number of fines time period. So the, when the increasing number of constant may lead to compounding problem, that means higher computational cost and complex interpretation of the parameters. Um, therefore, different researchers suggested uh, a functional approximation uh, for the alternative specific constants 
For example, Abu Zaid uh, et al. proposed a trigonometric formulation for the ACs, or his et al. proposed both parametric and non-parametric formulation to understand the time preference using constant. However, none of these studies have considered the correlation between outbound return or the duration. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is the gap where we want to address through our research. And uh, the aim of our research is to develop a joint model of outbound and return departure time choice for car commuters. And here our objective is to propose a polynomial functional form of ACs capturing the interaction among constants of outbound and duration. Then to compare the developed functional form with the state of art method for capturing time of day preference based on trigonometric formulation. So um, for the purpose of this work, we have used the data collected from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, it's an uh, arrival preference data collected by uh, TIPSA uh, as part of a subway project. It's the one day travel diary survey. Um, survey. And total number of observation they have collected is 35,000 households. However, as we are using only commuter trips by car, and in Bangladesh, only 5% people hold, uh, possess the car. Therefore, the total number of trips we found here that can be usable for modeling purpose is 950. Now I will discuss about the major, major modeling issues, that is choice set specification, estimation of travel time, and model structure. So for the departure time choice model, uh, choice set specification is an important step. Um, so in the usual specification, a separate uh, constant is recommended for each alternative. Uh, so if we fall in, in, in our case, we have selected 14 different alternative time periods where 10 different time periods were one hour and uh, four different time periods are two hour time period. And if we follow the n into n plus one by two formula, then we, we will have 105 different time periods but in the data, there were some missing informations and some of the alternatives are not uh, like uh, reliable there. So we, we ended up with uh, 68 total number of uh, alternatives for the purpose of our work. And then the second uh, thing is uh, the estimation of travel time. For the travel time estimation, we have uh, used the methodology um, uh, yeah, that we um, uh, that we proposed in our recent work of uh, departure and time choice modeling. It is already accepted in transportation research record. But here I, I would like to highlight that why we have uh, used this method for the purpose of estimation of travel time. Uh, in different studies, they have used Google, Google Map Direction API to estimate travel time for different time periods. But it's problematic in, in case of Dhaka, particularly in developing countries, because uh, here both motorized and not motorized modes are, are shared um, uh, by a common roadway space and traffic signals are not um, uh, automatic. So they are manually operated. Therefore, the travel time estimated become more sensitive to the proportion of vehicles available within the road. Second reason is uh, uh, that most of the cars in Dhaka are shipper driven. And this GPS technology um, are, are not used by them that much. Therefore, they, uh, they use their intuition to select a particular route um, rather than using the shortest route proposed by the Google. Uh, therefore, we found a significant difference between uh, Google Map provided uh, travel time and their stated travel time. So we tried to develop a sub model uh, to establish a relationship between stated travel time and Google Map provided uh, travel time. So Google Map provides three different mod, uh, travel time using three different models. Uh, so one is the best case, one is the, the second one is the optimistic, and the third one is the pessimistic. So we try to establish a relationship, and uh, then with the, the weight we observe from them, um, we use to calculate their uh, travel time for the purpose of our work. So this is the um, structure of our model, and we followed the um, random utility uh, uh, framework. So here, each um, uh, following this framework, decision makers always choose the alternative um, that has the highest utility. So here we is the systematic uh, part of the utility that is observed, and its silent is the non-observed part. Here we assume that it is uh, independent and identically distributed among our, the alternatives. And then we subdivided this systematic part in three different components. 
One is the utility associated with the departure. Uh, the second one is the utility associated with the duration. And the third one that is new addition to our model is the interaction between departure and duration. This is quite important because uh, people departing uh, for, uh, for a, for a work, work trip, 8 a.m. in the morning um, would not be same like someone uh, traveling in the evening, 8 a.m., 8 p.m. Uh, for the same activity duration. So this interaction term is quite important to understand the departure time choice. Then this uh, utility, uh, we provided this functional form. It's nothing but a, a plus bx plus cx square formula, but um, uh, we extend it uh, using this uh, power formulation. And here a, b, and c is, uh, are the uh, non-negative integer and used here as a truncation point. And um, this truncation point is uh, defined based on our empirical observation. And then uh, with this utility, we um, interacted with different uh, sociodemographic uh, dummies. Uh, here we have considered six different sociodemographic factors. One is office employee, then the Uber user, short distance traveler, uh, female, and, and having dependent within the family and uh, ha have higher income and greater than 60,000. 60, so now I will talk about um, the, our result. So um, following this, uh, so this is the result uh, fitted with the RP data and um, following the trigonometric formulation, you can see that it performed better compared to the polynomial formulation. And, uh, uh, but for the trigonometric formulation, we have to estimate uh, for 24 uh, parameters and our proposed polynomial formulation, even though it has uh, a, um, a poor model fit, but we have to estimate nine um, parameters. And uh, uh, from the, this is the output of the, uh, the maze model. And here we have an interacted with the sociodemographics. So here you can see that uh, the interaction effect that is not considered in the uh, trigonometric formulation is significant and has influence um, in defining um, uh, people's uh, departure time choice. And also here the travel time is better, um, uh, better estimated uh, using our proposed formulation compared to the trigonometric formulation. And uh, um, uh, this uh, result can be better understood with this graph. So this is the observation of uh, outbound and return trip. And uh, this is the uh, graph from the trigonometric formulation. Then you can see that after a certain period, uh, this trigonometric formulation um, or overfitted, overestimated that data. But when we look at the surface plot data from, the, uh, from our proposed polynomial formulation, um, it, it, all, it all resembles to the um, reality and doesn't have that overestimation uh, problem. And uh, this is the result where we have interacted different sociodemographic variables with our base model. And here you can also see that interaction is significant at the base parameter as well as parameter with uh, different sociodemographic um, uh, shifts. And after including those uh, sociodemographic um, uh, dummies, our model performance improves significantly. And uh, this effect is better understandable with uh, the surface plot that we have proposed. For example, for the office employee and Uber user, they, they have the highest utility at 8 a.m. in the 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning for the outbound and 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. in the evening um, for the return. So in Bangladesh, the usual office starting time is 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and closing time is 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. So this two time is considered as the peak time uh, uh, for um, in case of Dhaka. So it is intuitive that uh, office people uh, prefer to travel in the off peak time to avoid the um, uh, late penalty at office in the morning and uh, the uh, peak, uh, peak hour congestion in the evening. This is also um, applicable for the uh, Uber user because they might try to avoid the peak surcharge and prefer to have this off-peak time period for the traveling purpose. However, for the short distance commuters, female commuters and high income commuters, the highest utility is nine to 10 a.m. for the outbound. Um, this might, uh, and that means this group of people are less sensitive, less sensitive to the peak hour condition. So this group can be targeted for the 
um, like um, morning time congestion pricing policies. However, uh, in the evening time period, the short distance commuters and high income traveler prefer to travel in the off peak time, uh, whereas the uh, female commuters prefer to travel nearly in the peak time. This might be attributed to the fact of the uh, concern of safety and during travel and um, uh, in the evening time period for the female commuters. And finally, well, when we are considering that having dependent within the family, the commuters prefer to travel both in the off-peak time in the morning and also the least of the, uh, the most off-peak time in the evening time period that is uh, uh, like uh, 8 to 10 p.m. in the evening. Um, though we didn't have that much data ab about the uh, either they are accompanying their children or um, the older people and, uh, available within their family. So we could not further investigate uh, how is this trip is affected by this um, or, or how they are choosing this time period for this. Um, but this can be addressed in the future research. So um, from our from this work, um, we come to this point that um, our this proposed model, even though it has uh, a poor model fit with the, our state of art trigonometric formulation method, but it reduces the computational cost by reducing the number of constants required to model um, require, required to estimate the time preference model. So if we use the full constant set, then we have to use 68 constants to estimate the model. But here we have to use only nine uh, base more uh, nine parameters for the base model. Also, our research addresses the issues associated with the correlation between the outbound and duration and uh, better estimates the travel time. And our model can accommodate multiple peaks without a priori assumption that uh, that was done in um, his uh, his formulation. And um, for the uh, since we have on, uh, only adapted our model to the commuters, so for the future research, this can be um, and this can adapt uh, non-commuters to validate our proposed functional form uh, as an alternative to, to the uh, use of full set of um, constants. So um, thank you so much if you have any question and it's open for discussion now. So Zanat, thank you. Thank you for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation of your research that seems to be quite well progressed. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at this point. I will ask though about the uh, departure time choice element. Do you treat the different uh, departure time windows uh, as mutually independent in, this, in the sense of the uh, error term. So uh, um, is there no correlation in the model between say 8.30 to 9 and 9 to 9.30? Uh, or have you managed to incorporate correlation in your choice structure? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. It's a uh, really very um, good question. So here we have used uh, the um, MNL model structure. So um, we cons we assume that uh, our alternatives are independent and uh, they do not have that correlation. And uh, since we have used the joint choice, that means 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning and 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. evening, these two are considered as one choice. In that case, uh, we can assume that this choice is independent than the choice from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning and 5 p uh, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the evening choice. So, and the correlation between the departure time and the duration is captured with this uh, interaction effect in our model. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, colleagues, please. Um, so, uh, um, what more can you tell us about this work? Uh, how do you see it uh, developing in the uh, uh, run up to writing your thesis and finalizing it? What, what more do you expect to achieve? Um, so, still it's uh, in the developing stage um, uh, but my intention is to uh, implement this in a multi-agent simulation platform uh, 
to see that if we if we implement congestion pricing uh, and uh, the outcome from our this research that who would be the our targeted group to implement the congestion pricing and then to see that how their travel behavior is changing um, in the larger scenario. So this is the, our, my uh, first stage, stage of my research where I am trying to understand that who will be affected by this congestion pricing Reason. or road taxing policies. And then uh, uh, this outcome will be implemented in, uh, in an ag agendas platform to see the bigger scenario and how this policy could be fruitful in case of uh, Bangladesh or maybe in terms of in other developing countries. Very good. Uh, um, and uh, one last contribution from me. Uh, do you have any indication of policy sensitivity of your model? Have you seen changes in DACA that you've managed to track through your model? Uh, since I'm now working in the cross-sectional uh, data, so uh, using the cross-sectional data, it's uh, uh, hard to see the change, but um, my next coming up uh, stage would be to see this change uh, where I would like to uh, see the shift of the change from um, like from 2010 to 2019, because my current data is from 2019. Uh, and I also have the collection of data from 2010. So this would be my next stage. So why we would like to see this change, the how this change within this 10 hour time periods. Very, very good. Well, that will, that will be a, a tough test for any model. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish you success. Now, uh, um, I will have one, one more call for uh, contributions, either from co-authors or uh, audience. Uh, I, I see, uh, I don't see anything in the chat uh, if colleagues wish to speak up. Um, otherwise, I think uh, we will draw this presentation to a close. Zana, thank you. Wishing you success in your uh, doctorate and uh, look forward to reading further publications in due course. Thank you so much. And um, if you have any question, you can send me an email in my email address. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, at this point, um, I have the uh, pleasure of addressing you not as uh, chair, but uh, as presenter. And uh, I just need to find out how to make my uh, screen work in that way. So, um, I think it's this. And so. Good. So. Uh, I'm gonna pause, we still see a presenter view. If you want to you, full screen, you are ah, okay. In that case, I have been sharing. Thank you for uh, the quick feedback. I think that means I need to share um, a different screen. <laughs> Try that one. Is that better? It is. That's full screen. Thank you very much. So, um, Today, I will be presenting uh, work that was undertaken by Felipe Gonzalez, uh, a, now a doctoral graduate from the uh, Catholic University of Chile, principal supervisors Juan de Dios Ortuza. Um, Felipe visited me in London um, for a year and uh, uh, we worked together on his thesis. Uh, neither Felipe nor Juan de Dios uh, was available for this presentation, so it's my pleasure to tell you about the work, principally Philippe's work. So um, we, the the uh, work was looking at uh, multiple choice heuristics and could asking could these be identified uh, from a single data set. Um, I need to find out. Here we go. So the, there's a, a question that is uh, wide, widely 
raised in transport studies. How do uh, individuals choose between discrete alternatives? And our um, most usual implementation of this, of course, is for uh, choice of mode. And there are many models of decision processes for a population, but uh, Philippe asked the question, investigate the question, uh, whether different individuals might use entirely different decision processes. So uh, when we look at uh, choice heuristics, as you call the models, uh, those are widely used random utility maximization, or RUM, either in logit or probit form or similar. But uh, there are many other uh, possibilities that have been uh, presented in the literature, random regret, minimization, elimination by aspects, satisficing, uh, plus uh, something like a dozen others. Um, and the question is not so much which one of these is best, but can we mix the models? So in this presentation, uh, we're going to be looking at the possibility that there are several distinct behaviors exhibited within a single sample uh, representing the population, of course. So we're going to start off with a formulation of a model with multiple choice processes, uh, analyze some of the model properties, uh, and uh, then look at what that means for our model estimations. Is there a theoretical basis for estimating a model like this? Um, then uh, we have some simulation results to investigate the practicality of identifying models in a context where we know what the answer is, because we simulated the data. And we have some conclusions on uh, identification of coexistence of different choice processes. So uh, this approach fitted into um, a, a latent class model where well, we don't know which choice process is used by uh, an individual. So uh, the, we identify uh, the choice heuristic with a latent class. And we suppose each individual belongs to a single one of these classes. And uh, uh, the model considers different latent classes of individuals with each class having a different choice heuristic, and we can represent this uh, graphically with uh, a probability of lying in a different class and within each class, different preferences for the alternatives available. Now, the um, probability of an alternative being selected is calculated then using the usual formula for conditional probabilities. Um, and uh, we identify possibility of uh, uh, heterogeneity in across the population uh, with in the probability function and in the preferences. And I point out that each of the preference sets is identical. So we're not looking at different, um, uh, different choice sets under each of the preference, they're all the same. So our model uh, in the two heuristic case uh, heuristic A and heuristic B, has a probability that an individual Q chooses alternative I. Well, there's a probability pi A that they're using heuristic A. And then the conditional probability P A Q I that under heuristic A, they choose individual, uh, choose alternative I. A complementary probability, one minus pi A, they're in, uh, um, they use heuristic B. So the, the uh, likelihood function is straightforward. It's just the, uh, the probability associated with the alternative that was chosen. And then the log likelihood function uh, across the population is the sum of the logs of the individual likelihoods. And uh, the analysis that I'll present is based on this uh, log likelihood function. Uh, seem to have, uh, right, here we go. So here is the log likelihood function, and uh, we can consider three cases. The first case, pi A is zero, corresponds to 
uh, probability of zero, the probability of heuristic A is zero, so everyone uses heuristic B. Similarly, if pi A is one, uh, then the uh, then everyone uses heuristic A. And the more interesting case is coexistence of heuristics within the population. And that means pi A is strictly greater than zero and strictly less, less than one. And those are the three cases. Um, so the first order condition for stationarity in uh, this interesting case is that the uh, log likelihood is stationary with respect to variations in each of the parameters, that's the parameters and the choice heuristics, and uh, the uh, pi, the choice, uh, uh, the uh, proportion in each heuristic. So doing the differentiation is straightforward, and we end up with this formula, uh, supposing that the class membership functions, the pi's, are constant. Um, and uh, it's easy to see that the stationarity condition, and uh, we recognize the denominator here is the total probability of uh, the chosen option. So uh, we, the stationarity condition is equivalent to the sum over the population of the uh, probability conditional over the probability unconditional is equal across each of uh, the heuristics. And we can generalize that to uh, non-constant class membership functions. In this case, the parameter sets that are disjoint between the class membership function and uh, the choice heuristic. So um, the analysis shown is the simplest. So um, there is a, an interesting analytical result that tells us the, um, uh, uh, the, the value of this sum is equal to uh, the size of the sample Q. And um, in the uh, case, the extreme cases of pi A zero or pi A one, we get inequalities, so no stationarity. Um, and this, tells us rather interestingly that uh, we, we have requirements for coexistence. Each heuristic must outperform the other in at least one observation. Otherwise, uh, one of these sums would dominate the other. Easy to see. So uh, that means that the ratio of heuristic A to the total probability must be bigger than one for some observations and B bigger for than one for others. We might have balanced numbers, uh, similar numbers in each case, or we could have a dominant heuristic, uh, happens most frequently, uh, but the ratio in the non-dominant case being uh, extreme in a few cases, and that is possible. Now, um, the estimation process uh, gives us estimates with approximately normal distribution and uh, a covariance matrix we can estimate by the inverse of the information matrix. This is uh, classical statistical uh, methodology. And when we look at the inf information matrix, the second derivatives, we see in the middle, the second derivative of uh, the uh, log likelihood with respect to uh, the heuristic probabilities. And that we can evaluate, evaluate analytically. It's the square of the difference between the probabilities according to the heuristics uh, divided by uh, the probability in uh, the total probability. And that's summed over all the, all the individuals. Now, uh, what's clear is that for high accuracy, we need this sum to be large. And that means we want a big difference in the probabilities. Now that makes good sense because uh, the more distinct the heuristics are in their probability choices, the better chance of identifying. So um, we can generalize all of these results to non-constant class membership functions multiple choice heuristics, more than two choice heuristics, 
uh, and even both of those, multiple choice heuristics of non-class membership, non-constant class membership functions. Uh, and we proceeded to uh, test this uh, in simulation. Okay, so we wanted to look at uh, the effect of sample size, uh, disjoint or intersecting sets of uh, parameters, population proportion to the choice heuristics, and the type of heuristics. Which pairs of uh, which sets of heuristics are identifiable uh, concurrently? Uh, what we didn't do uh, was uh, investigate difference due to sensitivity parameters. Because we simulate, we can uh, ask how well can we recover uh, models? How well can we identify the models? Our simulation set was based on uh, uh, transport modes observed in Chile, but only based on that loosely. We chose for each individual three alternative modes. And for each of those modes, we looked at monetary cost, travel, walking and waiting time and suppose those were the explanatory variables. Our samples, one observation per individual, so uh, no repeat observations, and we started with 10,000 individuals as a baseline. And ben, we can't hear you right now. Is everything okay? Matt, any thoughts? I think it should go back. He was a little choppy at the beginning. It just may be a, a slight Wi-Fi issue, but we're still overall on time. Let's, let's give it a couple more seconds. Yeah, it's funny how hard it is for speakers sometimes to tell when they go offline. <laughs> it happened yesterday with our headliner in um, out of Hong Kong. Um, but it wasn't her fault. It was because the Zoom room was double reserved at that moment. So I guess he's coming back in. Yes. And of course, Matt also has access to his slideshow with the recording. Those are always a nice backup to have in these situations. Share my screen. So any questions for Ben or me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a co-author on this paper, by the way. I was writing some of you to add your photos. I appreciate uh, that you've done that, Chun Hong and uh, Sarah. Oh my gosh, so nice. Jason, uh, Mark. Well, Matt, uh, you might want to grab that presentation. This is part of the reason I always go to my office. <laughs> I do not trust the home Wi-Fi, but also really like the uh, the privacy and the quiet of the office. Yes, I'm looking at the drive and I don't see it there right now. Um, <laughs> Our moderator didn't upload his presentation. So yeah, we got almost all, I think we got about 60 out of the 72 uploaded. So that was pretty impressive. But yeah, I don't have Ben's cell phone number. If anybody has that, I think he realizes that something's probably gone wrong. Um, well, you know what? Matt does have backup presentations to show. <laughs> so this is our other backup. He uh, grabs another one or he starts presenting himself. Oh, I, I did find it. Okay. <laughs> it was just later than I had downloaded. So I can open it up, I guess. Um, and Try to get to the right uh, portion, I guess. Thank you. So Matt's a PhD student here at UT. Sarah's also a graduate student here at UT, but not with me. She's the air quality. Um, and Jason Hawkins is a postdoc with me, but he's about to become a professor at the University of Nebraska. So these guys, um, Jason and Matt have helped a lot with this conference. Still downloading. It's a little slow in the office over here with Wi-Fi. Um, Big file. Mm -hmm. Everybody else's presentations, but his. <laughs> How many megabytes is it? 
800, I think. Megabytes? Yes. Oh my gosh. For a, a 20 minute presentation, boy, that's maybe the biggest one we have there. So yeah, this could go on for a while. Hmm. Last night when I was listening in and we had a, a, a dead moment, I showed everybody my dog, <laughs> which people really like seeing. Do any of you have a, a dog who's with you <laughs> or a cat? Or children. <laughs> yeah, Jason has a baby. Not I'm in a different house today. <laughs> So uh, Matt, are we much closer to 800? Because that's a lot to download. I'm halfway through. Um, the elevator just went by, so the Wi-Fi went down. <laughs> so Matt and I are on the same floor. This is so funny. His Wi-Fi is affected by an elevator. Can I buy you a hard, uh, a hard line there for 300 bucks? <laughs> There's only one port in this room, and it goes up to the main computer that I have that I need to access from home. So. If you want to, you know, do the other legwork of installing another Ethernet port. Yeah, so let me. Sometimes they don't allow multiple lines in an office, but yeah, feel free. So I'm thinking, what slideshow could I just bring up? Hmm. Well, Hani Mamasani, I think many of you got to hear his keynote this morning. We had over 100 people in that Zoom room, which was great. And he talked a lot about, uh, the information and communications technologies. I think Mike Hyland and I were talking about this earlier um, because uh, Mike is a student of Hani Ramasani's. Uh, in any case, uh, how COVID has been an incredible natural experiment and how our economies, at least here in the US, you know, stayed very resilient somehow with a dramatic change in behavior and an uh, incredible reliance on the internet. And of course, Zoom, <laughs> Zoom uh, jumped. Dramatically, this is the best webinar software I've ever seen, and we were using it before COVID um, for our BTR number one. So we've always been really happy with uh, with Zoom, but of course we did just lose Ben, <laughs> so it does require some bandwidth. And um, next year at the same time, approximately, we'll have BTR number four. And just like this year, we'll probably have paper submissions due in March. So we hope you guys will uh, send some in. Of course, you can present them in other conferences. This is a very casual conference. We don't share your papers or anything, but we do peer review them. So you get a couple of reviews back typically, and that helps us decide who, who makes it into the conference. Um, and we are also double tracking. So we've got the Eastern hemisphere and the Western so that globally anyone can be awake uh, for at least you know, half the presentations. Although it's a little tricky probably from a couple countries. Um, I'm thinking India, it could be a little tricky time of day. Sorry, that's presentation. I'm trying to find the exact spot even. Um, Thank you, Matt. Have we seen this slide right here yet? with the outline. Mike. <laughs> Fahid. <laughs> Not so, quite sure where. Well, we have about 40 minutes left. I don't know if that can help you, you know, pace it. Sure. Yes, just let me know if any of these slides look familiar with the, of where we ended off. Because I know I've, we've seen this. So when we anybody yeah that looks close <laughs> okay I will play it so when thanks Jason oh charisma saying it might oh, be two slides okay then maybe here Yeah, if you start from there, that's probably fine. Okay. Sorry, my dad's so having a meeting in the background. We need a, this balance to be achieved. And uh, uh, that means that for some observations, the ratio of the conditional probability to the total probability must be greater than one for some observations in each of the two heuristics. If that weren't the case, we could not achieve 
at the required balance. Now that might happen because there's a similar number of uh, cases where each is bigger than the other. But there is another possibility that for most observations, one of the heuristics works better, whereas for, the, for a small number of observations, the other heuristic works very much better. And we can achieve a balance that way. So uh, we're going to uh, move on to the second order conditions. Uh, the information matrix is based on uh, the matrix of mixed second derivatives. Uh, and uh, that tells us about the covariance of estimation of so when we look at the form of that matrix, we find within it uh, the second derivatives of likelihood with respect to uh, the membership probability pi. And when we evaluate that, we find that it has the form of minus the sum of the differences in the conditional probabilities squared. So according to that, the bigger the difference in conditional probabilities, the greater the identifiability. Um, and uh, that tells us that uh, a few cases of large difference promote identifiability. And also because we sum over the, uh, uh, the sample, uh, the more elements in the sample, the greater the identifiability. So we're going And I see that Ben is now in the room and he has co-host permission. So if you want to resume from your slide and, uh, and speak, that would be great. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I think I need to share my screen again, don't I? Uh, this will stop the others sharing, yes. Uh, um, so if I share my screen, this one. Okay. We so uh, do you have the uh, heuristic distribution in the experiments? I do, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. I apologize for that. Uh, I had an internet outage. Uh, it's one of the perils of uh, uh, this mode. But I'm back with you. Thank you for your understanding and patience. So uh, the combinations of heuristics that we used in our experiments, we, uh, we had random utility model uh, which we included to absorb any apparently irrational choice. Uh, and against that, we tested random regret, uh, stochastic satisficing, and elimination by aspects. So pairwise, each one at a time. And we used uh, two proportions, 70% random utility with 30% of the other choice, or we reversed those 30, 70, depending, uh, well, we, we tried both cases. We simulated each of those combinations uh, 10 times to get a, a, a small sample. Um, and we also looked at correlation between class membership and the choice parameters, either no correlation or a, a positive correlation, which we controlled by a, a sim single trait parameter representing a binary sociodemographic char characteristic. So the effect that had on uh, the probability of using the random utility model was to increase the logic choice probability uh, according to the coefficient theta one of uh, uh, the trait parameter. And we arranged that there was a 20, 80% uh, probability of using random utility model of the traits present, 50% otherwise, and uh, we balanced the proportions to uh, match. Okay, so random utility model, I uh, suppose, doesn't need much explanation to this audience, but uh, linear in the parameters and the probability of choosing an option depends. Uh, random regret compares each um, each alternative with all of the others and uh, minimizes the difference. Uh, the the, uh, the 
the profundity of the regret is controlled by a parameter mu. Um, so the greater the profundity, the more, um, the less likely uh, an option is to be chosen. Stochastic satisficing, we um, uh, looked for um, ac probabilistic acceptability criteria, and we scanned through the uh, alternatives, looking at the binary acceptabilities, small a kiq, uh, the product of these binaries is only one if they're all one. And uh, the probability of each uh, criterion being acceptable is uh, given by this logic. And then elimination by aspects, we ranked the attributes, cost, travel time, walking time, waiting time, alternative specific, according to their uh, importance. And uh, we identified thresholds that uh, divided ranges into acceptable or unacceptable and applied this algorithm. We choose an available aspect and discard all alternatives that are unsatisfactory. And we continue doing that until we've only got one remaining alternative. And that then is the one that's chosen. So we have these uh, uh, four heuristics and we mix them in our uh, samples. Then um, because all the heuristics have the same attributes, then identifies detect identifiability is detected exclusively uh, by the difference in the choice probabilities. And the results of this, we express qualitatively in terms of the difference between um, the absolute probabilities, so excuse me, the absolute probability dif differences between the different heuristics. And for random utility model versus uh, random regret, the distribution is clustered very much close to zero. So there isn't a lot of difference. Uh, compare with uh, random utility versus elimination by aspect or random utility ver versus uh, stochastic um, satisficing, then we find there's a rather broad distribution. So there are more cases of large absolute probability differences. So we expected uh, the random utility model uh, to be distinct from uh, elimination by aspects and satisficing, but uh, rather difficult to detect. It's different from uh, uh, random regret. Now, the uh, results we viewed qualitatively, uh, no identifiability, meaning we cannot identify more than one heuristic. Weak identifiability with heuristics could be separated, but the parameters not, and strong identifiability all the parameters uh, were identified, and the model in that case is useful for practical applications. So, excuse me, here we go. The results, comparing random utility with random regret, we find that there was no coexistence detected. Uh, whichever heuristic dominated, 70% random utility or 70% random regret, no correlation or positive correlation. Um, in each case, only one of the heuristics was identified, and most usually uh, it was uh, random utility. Um, uh, and in, when random regret dominated, it was uh, rather weak. So we couldn't detect coexistence in this pair. Um, Increasing the sample size from 10,000 to 20,000 or 40,000, uh, we've, we've heard of 200,000 observations, so although they seem large numbers, um, they're not completely out of, out of uh, whack. Um, but that was insufficient as well. Now, comparing random utility with stochastic satisficing, uh, we could detect coexistence when the, when the stat stochastic satisficing dominated. Otherwise, it was weak. So this is with the 10,000 observations. Uh, moving up to 40,000, we could uh, identify coexistence in all four cases. Uh, so uh, stochastic satisficing rather different. 
And illumination by aspect, uh, we only needed 10,000 observations to identify coexistence. Um, now, we used Bayesian estimation, so this um, balance equation shouldn't hold exactly. We don't expect it to hold exactly, but with large samples, uh, we expect Bayesian methods to be approximately uh, uh, equivalent to likelihood maximization. And the, uh, uh, the balance was between 2093 and 2097, there was a 0.2% difference on our samples. Um, and we, we viewed that as close agreement, even if not exact. So the insights, um, we've got an analytical insight, behavioral differences uh, are required to identify uh, difference in models. Uh, in the context of mode choice, uh, random utility was the most robust, and uh, we certainly recommend the inclusion of that in any mixture model. Random regret, we couldn't differentiate from random utility, uh, try as we may. Stochastic satisficing requires a large proportion or a large sample size, or both. And uh, elimination by aspect seems to be very distinct from random utility. Question about correlation, well, uh, no substantial effect that we could detect, so that doesn't seem to be a relevant issue. Further investigations, well, we'll look at multiple heuristics, three together, um, uh, random utilities, stochastic satisfying and elimination by aspect is a natural choice. Um, because the random regret somehow has eliminated itself. Um, larger choice set sizes rather than the three we worked with, observed real data sets and an extension of the analysis. So thank you for your attention. Um, I, uh, I have other slides, but I will um, cease sharing. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we have scope for um, scope for a few questions, which I will take, but I have to commit myself to finishing on time. The first question, latent models are regularly so hard to detect. Um, well, we, uh, we have a criterion for detection of latent models. It might be possible to get a better algorithm, uh, um, uh, an EB algorithm uh, estimation, um, EM algorithm, estimation maximization might work better. We haven't experimented with that in detail, but we know what we're looking for. We need the latent classes to, um, to be uh, uh, as distinct as possible. So thank you for that comment, Cara. Um, and keeping camera off helps save bandwidth. <laughs> That's a message for everyone. Uh, I don't know whether my camera was on or off. So uh, can I ask, does anyone else have a question they wish to um, put to me? If not, well, I will be open to discussion, uh, as I'm sure my co-authors, Felipe Gonzalez and Juan de Dios Ortizar will be as well. Um, and welcome correspondence. We're looking to publish our, our work with all the analysis in due course. Uh, uh, Philippe gained his doctorate uh, about 18 months ago, I think. So he is now off working in industry. Um, as I'm Ali, are you uh, with us now and uh, ready for, yes, I see you're yeah. present. Are you ready to start your presentation? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, share my screen. Very good. So uh, I will introduce you. Uh, Azam Ali is an incoming doctoral student um, uh, here we are, uh, at the Institute for Transport Studies, University of Leeds in the UK. He's previously carried out his bachelor's in civil engineering and master's in transport planning and engineering. Uh, his research interest lies in the field of travel behavior and 
demand modeling. So as a Ali, uh, please tell us about your work and how you see it progressing in this early stage. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I can hear you fine. Um, other colleagues might. Uh, uh... Okay, uh, I'll uh, stop sharing my video so the bandwidth uh, remains. Uh... Wait a second. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is um, Azam Ali. Uh, I'm presenting my research, which is on the comparison of discrete choice models and machine learning techniques in the context of vehicle ownership decisions. I have carried out this work with Dr. Rush and Dr. Karishma Chaudhary, and it is largely based on my master's uh, dissertation at University of Leeds. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. I will be quickly going through the introduction of choice models and machine learning techniques, uh, followed by uh, my research methodology and aims. I will be spending most of my time in the comparison of the choice models and machine learning models, followed by the conclusion. So the basic framework of discrete choice modeling is that for a given set of explanatory variables and observed choices, and by using a decision protocol, for example, random utility theory, you can quantify what is the uh, effect, or, or you can quantify the effect of explanatory variables to the observed choices. For example, in vehicle ownership decisions, we would be interested in the uh, into uh, in finding the quantitative effect of household income in the probability of owning a car. Choice modeling has two main purposes, uh, relative, uh, relative valuation of uh, attributes and demand forecasting. On the other hand, supervised machine learning is that for a given set of inputs and outputs, uh, 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 a learning algorithm can be trained how to map or link the inputs with the output. This process is done entirely through a data-driven way and it is not linked to any uh, econometric or behavioral theory. In choice modeling, you need to specify the utility function. So there is always a risk of model misspecification. Similarly, there is like limited flexibility, how and where to build complexity in the model. Um, the, util uh, the utility function uh, mostly considers the effect of attributes as linear, but it is quite uh, possible that the effect of attributes is non-linear or marginal. Uh, then you need to add like different non-linear effects uh, on it. For example, uh, in vehicle ownership decision, it is uh, known that vehicle uh, household income has a non-linear or a marginal effect on uh, choice probabilities. Uh, on the other hand, as viewed uh, in the figure in the middle, you simply pour the data uh, into a machine learning algorithm and the complexity is dealt by uh, the training process. For example, neural network is considered to be uh, a universal approximator of any function uh, and it is said to be, uh, and it can easily handle nonlinear effects or, or, or attributes. However, one of the problems uh, in machine learning is that they do not offer any explanation which links the inputs with the output. For example, um, as viewed in the figure in the bottom right. So consequently, there have been many studies which uh, uh, compare machine learning techniques with choice models, and they um, and they show that machine learning techniques outperform choice models in terms of prediction accuracy. Uh, however, this is quite problematic as in uh, choice modeling, our primary concern is on probabilities rather than predictions. And similarly, we are, uh, uh, similarly, um, there is, um, uh, it ignores the stochastic or the probabilistic nature of choice model. Uh, so one of my key uh, research question is that I would be uh, comparing the, uh, the performance of choice models and machine learning techniques in probabilistic goodness of fit measures, uh, such as log likelihood, which is arguably the most uh, common um, uh, uh, probabilistic goodness of fit metrics. Uh, similarly, um, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, criticism of machine learning techniques is that um, is that it is hypo uh, hypothesized that since machine learning models uh, do not have 
um, uh, are not linked to behavioral theories, they will not be able to predict uh, in circumstances where there are substantial differences uh, in the uh, in the application context. So I would be uh, comparing this hypothesis as well. Uh, recently, there has been a rise in explainable or interpretable machine learning techniques in the machine learning community and um, the com uh, so I will be one of my key question is to see if these uh, machine learning models can provide consistent explanations in agreement with a priori beliefs. So, so the data which I have is from two household survey uh, surveys that were carried out in Dhaka, Bangladesh, in the year two thousand five and two thousand ten. Uh, the two uh, one thing uh, the choices um, are labeled as car more than one car, which is denoted as car plus motorcycle, bicycle, and no vehicle ownership. Uh, one thing to note is that the 2005 data set is quite small uh, to build um, a vehicle ownership uh, model, uh, a machine learning model. So, uh, so I will not be, um, uh, so I will be, uh, my primary focus will be on the 2010 data set. Uh, the explanatory variables which I have are the household size, number of earners, number of licensed drivers, number of children, and monthly household income. Between the year 2005 and 2010, uh, there has been a, a rapid increase uh, in the average monthly household income um, and uh, in the number of licensed drivers. So, the, uh, so my methodology to compare the choice models and the machine learning technique is that uh, for, for the choice models, I, uh, I would be using multinomial logit and nested logit model. Uh, and for uh, machine learning techniques, I would be using neural networks and gradient boosting trees, which are uh, the most widely used and the commonly used uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, uh, I will be. I have uh, used eighty percent of the data for uh, for training uh, the choice models uh, and the machine learning techniques, and twenty percent of the data is set aside for testing purpose or. Uh, uh, out of sample validation. Uh, similarly, the 2005 data set is used for external validation. Um, and I will be comparing the uh, the 2000, uh, the testing data set and external validation uh, uh, data set on goodness of fit me uh, measures such as log likelihood, uh, mean absolute percentage error of market shares, um, uh, and also of different market segments. Uh, to explain the machine learning models, um, I will be using some explainable machine learning techniques such as partial dependence plot, uh, Shapley values, and I will be comparing them uh, with the choice, uh, with the taste coefficients ob obtained from the choice models. Um, similarly, I would compare the elasticities as well. So now moving on to the estimation of the choice model, as I have said earlier, uh, monthly household uh, household income uh, has a non-linear or a marginal effect um, uh, in the utility of owning a car. Uh, in other words, that uh, um, with an increase in income, its effect on utility starts to decrease. So there is a need to induce a non-linear uh, or a saturation effect. Um, I have uh, specified household income into uh, four different um, categories, such as by using a logarithmic scale, by using threshold, piecewise linear transform, and gamma transform, which is also called as a box box transform. Uh, the best performance um, uh, um, for the multinomial logit model was observed uh, where uh, uh, where income was specified in a piecewise linear transform, as it has like the uh, highest log like likelihood and adjusted row square and the low, uh, lowest Bayesian information criteria. Uh, in this uh, category, household income has been divided into three different parts. Uh, the high income uh, group, uh, which is which represents the top 10% of the household and the bottom uh, and the middle represents uh, the middle 50% and low represents the bottom 40%. Uh, I have tried, uh, tried various nested logit model structures as well. However, uh, nesting uh, uh, nesting coefficients were not obtained in the uh, in the recommended range, hence they were not considered. Now, 
even though there is no need to specify the utility function for machine learning algorithms, a lot of effort uh, is needed uh, to train the model. All of the machine learning uh, techniques suffer from uh, the bias variance trade-off or which is uh, the balance between underfitting or overfitting. If a model has uh, no complexity, it will not be able to capture the data generating process. However, if it um, trains on error, uh, there is a risk of overfitting and there would be low um, uh, performance on unseen data set. So similarly, uh, machine learning techniques are, um, uh, are sensitive to hyperparameter tuning. Hyperparameters can be described as learning tools or learning knobs that control the learning behavior of an algorithm. Uh, to, to prevent this uh, overfitting and to select the hyperparameter tuning, a tenfold cross-validation technique was used. Uh, similarly, since machine learning algorithms do not have a closed form solution or uh, they do not have like a unique solution, um, uh, it is recommended to carry out multiple iterations uh, to, to get um, an average and a reliable results. And all of the uh, results which I have presented are um, are with uh, a mean and a standard deviation. To explain the machine learning models, uh, uh, I have used uh, three different techniques, which is uh, partial dependence plot. Partial dependence plot is quite easy to perform and visualize, and it simply shows the dependence of, uh, of an explanatory variable to the observed choice probabilities. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, this is quite similar to substitution pattern of alternatives found in uh, in choice modeling as well. Similarly, since uh, in most machine learning algorithms you can calculate the choice probabilities, uh, you can induce uh, uh, you can calculate the elasticities as well and R P elasticities. Uh, one of the new techniques to uh, explainable machine learning techniques is the Shapley additive explanations. The main idea behind this uh, method is that uh, it explains the, uh, the the contribution of each explanatory variable to the um, model's outcome uh, fairly. Uh, for example, in this line uh, graph, uh, it can be observed like what is the uh, effect of each explanatory variable at an individual level to uh, to the uh, to the probability of owning a car. Uh, now, moving on to the comparison of choice models and machine learning techniques. Um, in this slide, I have um, I, I have presented uh, the results um, of the machine learning models and the choice models uh, in the training, testing, and the 2005 data set. Um, it can be observed in the testing data set that uh, that the lowest, um, uh, that the highest log likelihood and the lowest uh, mean absolute percentage error of the market share is for the multinomial logit model followed by neural network and gradient boost increase. This indicates that uh, machine learning techniques do not outperform choice models in terms of prediction accuracy. Uh, to uh, in in the in the 2005 data, all of the mean absolute percentage error of the market shares were were quite high, and they were not. Uh, this indicates that there is a, a low uh, prediction of the 2005 des, uh, data set, and there is a lack of temporal transferability in all of these models. So, uh, one of the thing, um, one of the things uh, that a disaggregate vehicle ownership model should do is that it should be able to predict uh, vehicle ownership in different uh, traffic analysis zone or different geographical areas. So, uh, however, since that um, was missing um, in my data set, um, I tried to see whether uh, whether the neural networks and gradient boosting trees can capture the different market segments. Uh, for example, uh, I have specified the low income group, middle income group, and high income group. Uh, it can be observed that uh, neural network is able to um, achieve a good um, a match with the actual market shares and there is a low uh, weighted mean absolute percentage error of 1.24% um, and 1.63% uh, for the multinomial logit model. Um, and one thing that um, I must highlight is that while building the multinomial logit model, um, household income was specified um, uh, into these three different income thresholds. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, neural network and gradient boosting trees, all uh, the machine learning algorithms um, learn all of these uh, market segments uh, by themselves. So, so it uh, so they reduce the risk of model misspecification. Uh, 
Um, in this slide, I have uh, presented the substitution pattern uh, observed in neural networks with uh, with uh, household income. Um, this is this graph is quite intuitive. Uh, for um, for firstly, it shows uh, the probability the choice probability of owning a car uh, is uh, non linear, and it shows a saturation level as well. For example, uh, after a monthly household income of uh, one hundred twenty thousand Bangladeshi takas, the choice probability remains constant. Similarly, the probability of owning a motorcycle increases up to a uh, up to uh, 60000 uh, bangladeshi takas and after which it starts to fall and the probability of owning more than one car increases uh, similar results are also found in the choice models as well uh, the marginal effect of uh, household income can be uh, observed uh, uh, in the table in the right as the beta coefficient um, of uh, uh, of low, middle, and high are uh, decreasing for for cars. Uh, similarly, for uh, for motorcycles, it can be observed that uh, uh, that for uh, for low and middle income um, uh, a household uh, uh, income is uh, is positive um, and it is uh, statistically significant. Whereas for uh, high income, uh, the beta coefficient is negative and it's not. Uh, statistically uh, significant. So to sum up this slide, I would say that machine learning techniques can better visualize nonlinear response uh, of uh, better than choice models. Um, I tried to compare the sensitivities um, or, or to other explanatory variables as well. Uh, for example, I have uh, plotted the dependence of uh, number of children um, and uh, I have observed a change in probabilities rather than a complete substitution pattern uh, of alternatives. However, uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, some of these uh, dependents are opposite uh, compared to neural network and uh, uh, multinomial logit model. So uh, similarly, I also uh, compared the different elasticities uh, as well. However, apart from uh, how so uh, apart from um, income, all of the elasticities were quite were different between choice models and machine learning techniques. So this indicates that choice modeling can uh, not be fully relied um, on uh, on explaining the machine learning model results and uh, uh, choice modeling are remain uh, invaluable due to their link with uh, econometric theories and behavioral theories. So. Uh, Looking back at my research questions, um, one, uh, I find that uh, the performance of choice models and machine learning techniques are, uh, are quite similar, uh, even though in our data set, uh, the choice model outperforms machine learning techniques. And uh, these results are similar to some studies found uh, in the literature. Uh, in, um, for, uh, for some, similarly, um, we were able to find that uh, both the choice models and the machine learning techniques were not able to like uh, back us the 2005 data set, which indicates lack of temporal transferability and uh, the relative performance of machine learning techniques and choice models were quite similar. Similarly, uh, machine learning techniques can provide a nonlinear uh, response better than choice modeling, but uh, choice modeling remains invaluable due to their link with econometric and uh, behavioral theory. Uh, the future work which should be carried out is to uh, is to comp uh, is to bridge uh, the choice modeling and um, uh, machine learning techniques uh, rather than compare them. And uh, uh, there has a lot of uh, there has been some work carried out in this aspect. Um, uh, learning multinomial logit model. Uh, there is like this. Uh, this is a hybrid of a multinomial logit and a neural network. Uh, this can also be estimated on the data set and compared with the choice models and the machine learning techniques. So thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? First of all, as I'm, I, I would like to congratulate you on, on the extent of your investigation. You described yourself as an incoming doctoral student. So, uh, if this is your first year, you're off to a great start. Um, you know, other other uh, statuses, I think, are credible. So um, we, we have a couple of questions already come in. Um, oh. And... Uh, uh, Jason Hawkins um, made the comment that uh, from a mach machine learning perspective, um, a sort of uh, ensemble method 
I, I suppose, several different uh, styles of uh, decision rule could align quite well with the multiple heuristics. Um, yeah. yeah that's... But I, I think your um, uh, one of your findings that the multinomial logic model is hard to beat. Uh, yeah. Well, you you used um, a certain amount of modeling craft in yeah. designing it. And that, of course, is good news for us humans. <laughs> there, there is a future in uh, knowledgeable, uh, sentient beings, even in the <laughs> presence of machine learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm an enthusiast, others may be. Um, <laughs> but I think modeling is a craft. I'd, I'd like to ask you a specific question to you, though. Mm. How many parameters did your machine learning algorithms uh, have available? Uh, machine learning algorithms, um, they have like uh, a lot of uh, parameters. For example, um, the machine, uh, like the neural network, which I had for, um, had like 10 neurons and each neuron has like two adjustable parameters. So that is like 20, 20 parameters for the neural network and for gradient boosting trees, I'm not sure. Uh, there's 20 parameters total or 20 parameters per neuron? Uh, 20 uh, parameters uh, total because like my, uh, the explanatory variables which I have are quite limited. And um, I skipped this thing, but uh, I tried like various, uh, for example, um, my uh, hyperparameters uh, had a width of 10 and uh, it had only one layer. If it were like three layers, then uh, the number of uh, adjustable parameters would also be like multiplied by three. So, so this is not like a quite a deep learning uh, parameter. Thank you. So uh, I think that's uh, quite a parsimonious. Uh, neural network. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, do we have other questions or contributions, please? So, um, as I'm Ali in the, uh, um, uh, I'll invite you to tell us a bit more about your future intentions and uh, when will you be submitting your doctoral thesis? Oh, uh, well, actually uh, the funding which I have received is like for first I will carry out another master's, uh, then I will start my doctoral study. It's just like a, a four year integrated program at University of Leeds. So I have four years. <laughs> this, this really is your first year? Uh, yeah, it will start like uh, this September. Actually, let me clarify, this is his minus one year. So he did his first master's in transport planning and engineering last year. And this is based on his master's dissertation. And now the scholarship he has for PhD that uh, requires him to do uh, another master's in the first year uh, that's more uh, social science focused and then another three year of PhD. So he's, he's going to be around for a long while, <laughs> another four years. and do a lot of exciting things. Well, all the evidence is there. Good. Um, so what, what do you, how do you expect to take your uh, doctoral studies? As a, of course, it, um, it can change. Yeah, it, uh, I'm like more interested on, um, in the agent-based modeling or simulation, I would be like uh, focusing more on that, but. I think it would be a, a mix of free choice modeling and agent-based simulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, mo moving towards uh, simulation, will you see? Uh, uh, will you be looking to see whether multinomial logic models can be recovered from more complex simulations? Yeah, that that would be like a good, interesting thing. Like mm, if it could be in cover, yeah. Okay, uh, we, we have. Um, this uh, is more actually another... for just a follow up uh, thing yes, that I, those who are interested more about like choice modeling and machine learning combination or uh, contrasting. So, this is a special interest group recently I started with uh, along with Professor Ed Manley 
at Allen Turing Institute. Uh, so this is the UK's National Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. So I thought that uh, some odd of people from this group may be interested about joining that special interest group. Very good, very good. Um, so we uh, uh, we have a question from Ahmed Kabli. Yeah. Uh, can oh. can well, I suppose for as I'm Ali, uh, can you use accuracy to compare both approaches? Uh, accuracy is not like a good uh, comparison in my case because there is like uh, an issue of uh, aggregation bias or a class imbalance. Like for example, ninety percent of the uh, for the data uh, is uh, uh, is has like uh, no vehicle ownership. So if uh, if the machine learning model uh, only predicts that everyone will have no vehicle, uh, the accuracy would be ninety percent. So uh, there is a need to like shift towards a probabilistic uh, method and you, uh, you should calculate like the market shares by summing the probabilities rather than summing the individual predictions. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. of course, uh, uh, um, a properly formulated multinomial logic model will always recover uh, market shares. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's a, uh, yeah. not even a proper um, measure of fit, so it needs more than that. Good. Um, so uh, it sounds like Charisma Chadra's uh, special interest group is attracting uh, interest from uh, <laughs> experts. So I wish, wish you success with that, Charisma. Um, other contributions? Okay, uh, in that case, in the absence of further discussion, I'll um, uh, uh, Point you to um, uh, session four. Cara, will you will you take over at this point and advertise session four? Uh, sure, sure. It's just if you haven't had enough uh, Zoom today, uh, they are continuing on for almost another three hours on Rutledge's new uh, handbook of of transit, and so um, they've got a series of speakers who are chapter authors in that. 42 chapter book. Um, and then of course in five hours, we've got David Hensher kicking off the Eastern track for day two of Eastern uh, Bridging Transportation Research Olympics. Uh, um, and so that'll be on uh, Eastern time for Australia, but it's a nice time of day for people like me. It's 8 p.m. So after I have dinner, I'll be listening to David and then uh, many of the speakers that follow. And tomorrow we have uh, Don Shoup as our headliner. So he'll be kicking us off at 10 a.m. Central U.S. time. Um, he is considered the rock star of parking, according to New York Times. So if you haven't heard him speak before, uh, he could be quite humorous and uh, just a wonderful guy. He's a city planning um, emeritus professor at UCLA. Thanks, you guys. Take it easy. It's nice having you in here. Thank you, Cara, again, for uh, bringing us all together. My pleasure. Nice job, Azam. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you, colleagues, for joining us this evening. Thank you, speakers. And Matt, thank you for being our tech staff. Nice job. There were no Zoom bombers. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, I'll shift over to that other session. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.